Welcome to the conference on the socioeconomic connections between Eastern European and um, uh, South Africa. Thanks to everybody who joined today. Uh, we were very happy to see that uh, there were over 80 people who have registered for this event, those who are interested in connections between Eastern Europeans and um, uh, South Africa. I'm going to uh, start with a few technical uh, um, uh, moments and then uh, I'll um, uh, pass the word to uh, Kobus Rademeyer, who will uh, do the official opening of the conference. So this conference uh, is uh, recorded and it will be available uh, publicly. Uh, following the conference, um, there will be also a publication uh, with um, information from the presentations that will be sent to all people who have uh, registered. So thanks very much for your interest in this uh, event. We would appreciate if you can keep your microphones on mute during presentations uh, so that we don't have background noise. Um, and also, uh, the chat is open for questions. Uh, so please feel free to ask um, any questions during um, the presentation in the chat. We will also have uh, a few minutes after each presentation for immediate Q&A sessions. And uh, after all the presentations, we will have uh, also a slot of time for discussion. Um, I think uh, that's uh, it was a te technical um, um, moment. And I'll pass the word to Kobus Rademeyer, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, the mayor is head of Department um, of Humanity at Sol Platia University in Kimberley, South Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Chiminka, and good afternoon, everybody. And also from Sol Platia side, uh, Sol Platia University, a warm welcome to, to this conference. Um, we are very excited between Stefan, Chiminka, and myself. We, we're really excited about the turnout. Uh, it is, it's, it's been a long time coming and I am, if, if I may, I'm gonna start because there's, there's a long afternoon in front of us with some very exciting uh, presentations. And basically what I'm gonna do for a couple of minutes, I'm, I'm not even going to scratch the surface. I'm, I'm just gonna give a very brief background of very exciting things that, that I've picked up um, over the last couple of years, and um, I'm, I'm just going to start sharing my screen with you. Uh, I hope you can all see it. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Javinka. And I was I was asked to to give a bit of a background to uh, Eastern Europeans in South Africa, and um, in in looking at this, especially also from a historical point of view, I can keep you busy the whole afternoon. But I promise you, I'm, I'm just going to give you a little bit of snippets of, of, of the background to Eastern Europeans in South Africa, and more specifically from a, from a historical background. Now, a typical South African, I'm going to start with a problem. Um, and basically, this, this problem is that as, as history students at many South African universities, um, basically everything that they see and hear about Eastern Europe, it's all about Russia, the Second World War and the Cold War. And um, I was even as a student, and I don't want to give away my age, but <laughs> many years ago when I was a student, that's exactly what we learned about Eastern Europe. So I, you will see I've used the word accidental scholar because it was basically uh, backed on my interest on, on, on social history that I became accidental scholar of, of Eastern European history of Eastern European studies. And through this all, I've, I've just realized the, the, the captivating research opportunities that there is in South Africa, especially on, on Eastern European studies. And I'm, I'm going to come back to the social history in, in the very last slide, um, just to show you how accidentally I stumbled across uh, this wealth of information that's and, and this field that's, that's lying open. Right, so over the last, uh, I would say, seven years, I was, I was fortunate and I was also privileged to, to get involved uh, with various Eastern European 
uh, groupings in South Africa on a, on a level of research um, and uh, through, through people that uh, put me in contact with different diplomats on social level. And I've just started realizing how, how important um, it is for, for many or for all the, the Eastern European groupings that I made contact with in South Africa, how, how important that cooperation is for internally, but also as different groupings in, in South Africa. And I was amazed also to see that the kind of, of, of um, interaction and um, contact they had with, with South African communities. And as, as I got more and more contact with the different uh, communities, Eastern European communities in South Africa, I just started realizing the importance of, of cooperation. And I started digging into uh, many aspects of different histories. And it's, there's, there's just so many fascinating stories that is, has come to the fore. So as I said, I'm not gonna keep you long today. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna barely scratch the surface, but there's, there's a couple of things that I found fascinating and uh, I just want to share a couple of things with you. So if you look at the, 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 the comparison between Eastern Europe and South Africa, until the early 1990s, or basically that period of five years between 1989 and 1994, both South Africa and many of the Eastern European countries were under oppressive rule. So whilst South Africa was under apartheid, many countries in Eastern Europe had lost their independence and they were uh, under Russian rule. So during that five year period and, and afterwards, um, the period 1989 to 1994, there was a very strong focus looking at the independence um, of the different smaller countries in Eastern Europe, and at the same time, democracy in South Africa. And for and and I'm sure many of the pres, uh, presenters today will touch on on ties that the was established between these Euro Eastern European countries and South Africa after um, or during this period or after this period, the early 90s. And this was also a time of a great influx into South Africa of of migrants from from Eastern Europe. But at the same time, there was also a reversal of migration because there was a large number of of Eastern European migrants that came to South Africa that, that went back to their, to their homeland in, in Eastern Europe. <laughs> Sorry, so at, at this stage today where we are, the numbers and I'm, I'm sure the, the different delegates from the different uh, countries and presenters this afternoon will tell you that in many, many instances, the migrant, the number of migrants in South Africa today from Eastern European countries are not large. It's, it's, it's small in quantity, but the impact that they are making is, is massive. But right, so this whole idea of migration from Eastern Europe to South Africa, where did it all start? And um, if, if you go in, and look in the books, uh, the history books, the economic books, uh, many would tell you that this partnerships and this alliances only started uh, during that period of five years, 1989 to 1994. But actually, the influx and influence of Eastern Europeans to South Africa became, um, came about long before the end of apartheid and also long before the end of the fall of, of communism. And uh, I think uh, Javinka has, in, in the introduction to this conference, she has alluded to it, that the migration uh, to South Africa from Eastern Europeans were predominantly for political and social economic reasons. And I'm not even going to go into that. I know that many of the presenters today are, are going to look at that. So there's, there's historical evidence of very early involvement or influence of Eastern Europeans in South Africa. It dates back more than five and a half, uh, five, 500, 550 years to uh, the European explorers that came to the Cape of Good Hope in 1497. If you go to uh, a date in South African history that nowadays is, is seen as, as a dark date, 1652, with, with the Dutch that came to the Cape, it was not only the Dutch that came, there was a very strong Eastern European influence there as well. 
And as we carry on, and you will see I've jumped from 1497 to 1853. I mean, it's 400, almost 400 years, but there's, there's so many towns in the old Cape colony or the current Western Cape dating back to 1853 that was named after linkages from Eastern Europe. And if you start digging a bit deeper, you will see there are so many other examples. Family names uh, that people sometimes thought were actually Western European, which at the end of the day has a very strong Eastern European connotation. Uh, traditions and culture that had a very strong influence from Eastern Europe. And um, I will give you a very good example of that at, at the end of, of this very short introduction just to show you how um, unknowingly South Africans or migrants from Eastern Europe came to South Africa and people sometimes are not even aware of their own history of 100 or 150 years ago. So jumping to the 20th century in, in South African history or in South Africa, if you take something like the South African War, which some people would know as the Anglo-Boer War, that took place in 1899 to 1902. So if you only take that as an example, there's, there's so many influences and um, involvement of, of Eastern Europeans. And just one of the, of the, the greater examples you can look at is uh, Niku de Boer or Niku Brag Bragationi, that was a nobleman from Georgia that became involved in the war and he, he fought on the side of the Boers. Even if you go and look at the, the website of the Anglo-Boer War Museum in, in Bloemfontein, you will find that uh, four of the, of the um, Central and Eastern European countries that are involved here today, uh, there are names listed of, of people that took part as foreign volunteers in, in the South African War. So even then at the turn of, of the century in the early part of the 20th century, there was a great involvement in, of Eastern Europeans in South Africa. Four years after the war ended in 1906, they estimated, well, more than just estimated, uh, there was 18,000 people of European descent that was working in South African mines. And yes, many of, of these people, the majority of them were from Western Europe, but there is, is quite a number of names that is, is coming to light that is, is not a Western European that's from from Eastern European origin and it's many of these families actually stayed behind and they started a life in South Africa. But if you take a look at the two world wars, uh, the first world war and the impact of the coinciding Russian revolution was a, another catalyst for many people to move from Eastern Europe to South Africa. And on my last slide, I will, I will show you very clear indication of of exactly what, how that happened. Uh, during the Second World War, there was a large number or a number of Polish troops that uh, fought in North Africa. And this, these, this grouping of troops also included Ukrainian soldiers. Then there was the example of the 500 Polish orphans of Otsuren that, that came here between 1943 and 1947. And after the, 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 the children's home was closed, Many of them stayed behind in South Africa. And if you can start tracing all the in different individual countries, uh, Eastern European countries, and you can just see the massive impact that, that was made in South Africa beyond the Second World War. And you'll see, I, I basically stop uh, after the Second World War. So there's another gap of 70 years that I didn't even touch on. This was just to give you a, a very broad background of, of the importance and uh, the massive impact that was made by Eastern European uh, migrants to South Africa. Now, I've been promising you an example for, for basically the whole 10 minutes that I was speaking. And I want to finish off with, with this example. And this is something that I yet again stumbled upon by accident. Um, being a social historian and, and a, a keen sports historian, I was reading the book on Jonathan Kaplan, his, his biography. Now, for those of you who don't know him, he's, a, he's, he's one of the most renowned South African rugby referees. And he was telling the story of, of how his family came to South Africa. So on his father's side, his, his great-grandfather that left the area that is now known as Ukraine in 1869. 
on a ship going somewhere. And as he got off the ship uh, in, in, in what we know now as Durban, he took the passport of, a, of a, a man that died on the ship already. And in the passport was the man's surname and it was Kaplan. So he took his passport and his surname because obviously the dead man couldn't use it anymore. And he settled in Durban. And on his mother's side, uh, his grandfather was born in Warsaw in 1911. And his grandmother was born in Lithuania in 1922. And as a result, yet again, of the Russian Revolution, they also decided to leave uh, for South Africa via the UK in 1926. They also settled in Durban, and that shows you the connectation from both his father and mother's side, um, both from Eastern European descent and settled in South Africa, and um, the whole family is still happily here, or Jonathan's family. So uh, I've given you... As I said, not, not even uh, scratching the surface, I gave you a, a very uh, brief appetizer of what you can be expecting this afternoon. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to all the presentations that we are going to um, listen to. And thank you very much, everybody, again, for, for attending. And I really hope you are enjoying the conference. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Kobus. And uh, I'm just going to uh, mention that this event is organized by the Ukrainian Association of South Africa, the Polish Association of Siberian uh, Deportees, and the uh, Sol Platia University that uh, Kobus is um, uh, representing. Uh, we're also very grateful to all the uh, diplomats uh, who joined us uh, today and also supported the organization of this event, um, including the Ukrainian Embassy, Polish uh, Embassy, and the uh, Georgian embassy, a Serbian embassy, who, um, um, who wanted to uh, join this um, uh, event. Uh, thanks uh, a lot to our diplomats, uh, because you play a very important role in those connections between Eastern European countries and um, uh, South Africa. And um, uh, I would like to open uh, some uh, opportunity for interactions. Uh, if we uh, can... Um, follow the link that is um, going to be in the chat uh, now and i'm going to also share on the screen and uh, the can you see the menti.com so if you can um, um, open it, this link in the browser and put a link four one five three four three one two uh, you'll be able to uh, answer two uh, questions. So you opening this uh, link and please put the code in four one five three four three one two. Uh, it's going to ask you uh, a question. What is the country you represent? And uh, there is opportunity to put two countries, just in case uh, if you are like uh, me representing uh, both countries, uh, Ukraine and South Africa at the same time, you can put both of them, or you can um, uh, choose the countries that um, you are uh, representing. And uh, don't close the link because there is uh, another question. Uh, so. If you can um, uh, wait um, till we answer the first question. Is it working? Dvinka, the, yeah, Dvinka, the, the, the question that you put up is in fact the second question. Is it about the, is it about who is, uh, okay, I can see first answer that are coming in. I'm gonna share them with you so that we all can see who's in the room today. 
got some um, At the moment, three people um, replied. So we've got uh, people from Poland, from Kazakhstan, from uh, Ukraine. So you, you put the link um, that uh, is in the chat. And you can uh, put the code 4153-4312. to answer this um, uh, question. You can see the answer is coming in. There are uh, participants from Romania, Poland, Hungary, Kazakhstan. Uh, you can see also a uh, different spelling, Polska, Poland, um, Ukrainian, Ukraine, Romania, South Africa. Okay, we have uh, 14, uh, 15 respondents now. Bulgaria, thank you. Yeah, thanks also Georgia for joining. So you can see all different uh, countries there that um, are today in the room. Uh, we've got Ukraine, Hungary, Romania, Georgia, Poland, South Africa, of course, uh, Kazakhstan, um, Bulgaria, Hungary. Thanks a lot to uh, those who've uh, already uh, replied. We will wait for uh, a few more uh, seconds and the answers are still coming in. We've got 22 people who've uh, answered, answered uh, out of those who are in the room uh, uh, today. Um, and uh, we will be uh, moving to our second question. Uh, where we're going to be asking about your uh, background. So how would you describe yourself? And I'll share the answers with you. So majority in the room are researchers, uh, about 48%. Uh, of us. Um, you can uh, also choose few answers. Uh, so you can uh, also mention whether you are from uh, South Africa in the Eastern, Euro uh, Eastern Europe, interested in Eastern Europeans. Uh, so we can see it's 21% uh, in the room. And we also have people who are interested in who are from Eastern European uh, communities. Uh, also our diplomats. Um, uh, here. Thanks uh, a lot to all who uh, responded. I hope it's, uh, it feels uh, nicer to stay in a room where you know where people are from and uh, who is going to um, join our conversation today. Um, and thanks uh, again for, uh, for your participation. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Oksana Piatkovska uh, from uh, Ukraine, from the International Institute of Education, Culture and Diaspora Relationship in uh, Lviv. Um, and Oksana was uh, part of the team that done research on Ukrainian community in South Africa last year, despite uh, COVID. And uh, she will present uh, some of the findings on Ukrainian uh, migration, migrants in uh, South Africa and the economic cooperation. Uh, thank you, Grimka. Thank you very much. And let me first of all express my gratitude to the organizers of this wonderful conference and to our partner, Ukrainian Association in South Africa, especially its president, Grimka Karchulan, as a co-organizer of this event. 
Um, thank you for inviting me and uh, also my colleagues from the International Institute of Education, Culture and Diaspora Relations of the Polytechnic National University. Um, thank you for, for giving this actually opportunity to, sh to share um, our, uh, the, the results of our research. So um, I think I'll start sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see. So, um, as you can see, the, the topic of my presentation is the role of uh, Ukrainian um, uh, migrants in South Africa and promoting economic cooperation between their country of origin and destination. And to start with, I should say that uh, international migration, like any other global process, not only causes new challenges for participating states, but also opens new opportunities. Uh, including establishing contacts and mutually beneficial cooperation uh, between the migrant exchange countries. Uh, well, migrants and their links with the country of origin plays a key role in this process. Um, actually, these ideas are highlighted in modern uh, theories of, if, of international um, migration, particularly the theory of transnationalism and uh, migration system theories. And these three, uh, theories mostly focus on how migrants, by forming their own social and cultural space in host country, um, by maintaining also uh, different types of relationship with their origin country, have a positive impact on the relationship between those two countries. So let us take a look into the case of modern migration from Ukraine to South Africa and Ukrainian migrants' role on the promotion of economic cooperation between, between our two countries. First of all, let me introduce Ukraine as a source country of migration. Um, uh, Ukraine is one uh, is among top 10 uh, migrant sending countries in the world, and it's uh, holding eighth ranking position in this rank. Actually, in the year 2005, it had sixth position, but today it's on the eighth. And I should say that this is not because the number of Ukrainian migrants has dropped within that period. Actually, it raised, uh, but it is due to the fact that the global increase of migration is more rapid. So according to the latest UN data, total number of Ukrainian immigrants today is 6.1 million people. Um, where do Ukrainian migrants go? And it's quite obvious that more than 80% of them migrate to European countries. From the point of view of regional distribution, the share of African countries, and you can see, uh, is the smallest one. But if we take into account the dynamics of Ukrainian migration to African countries, you can see that for the last 10 years, the number of Ukrainians in African countries has more than tripled. And having analyzed these data, we can make a conclusion that the main reason for this is a significant increase in the flow of Ukrainians to the Republic of South Africa, from 1.6 thousand people to 6.7 thousand, uh, and a slight increase in Libya, as you can see. Well, generally speaking, South Africa has become the dominant destination country for Ukrainian immigrants among all African countries. And the share and, the, and its share today is almost 83%. Thus, my aim is to answer the to answer the key question: Does this migration pattern promote economic cooperation between our countries? A great number of empirical studies of international migration and economic effects on the migrants' country of origin conclude that migrants' role in facilitation of economic cooperation between their country of origin and country of destination depends on several factors, among which are the following, the economic integration and their uh, education level and entrepreneurship among migrants, also preservation of their uh, national identity and links with their country of origin. These are the most important, of course, and there are some extra factors which I'm not going to take into account uh, today in my presentation. Bearing in mind these parameters, to answer the key question of my presentation, I'll use the results, which um, Zvinka has already said, the results of our research, Ukrainians in South Africa, Society, Identity, Future. 
Um, we conducted the research, it was conducted uh, this research by a group of scientists from the institute I represent. And uh, actually it was initiated, I should say, by Zinka Kachur, who joined our working team and helped us a lot. So just a few words about the structure and the methodology of the research. We conducted qualitative. We uh, you, we conducted a qualitative research, but to reach more objectivity and to avoid the bias and also to make our findings more generalized, we combined the qualitative method with some statistic, uh, with some data ex, um, ex, um, extrapolation. So last year. In February and March, we conducted online 24 in-depth interviews with Ukrainian migrants from South Africa from four different cities, divided into three groups, uh, age groups, I mean, uh, of both sexes. Thus, we had six respondents from each city matching each sample criteria. The question we had 80 questions grouped into six thematic blocks in accordance with the structure of our uh, research. So um, the main idea of the survey was to understand the reasons of Ukrainian migration to South Africa, the integration process of Ukrainians and problems they face, the preservation of their national, cultural, and religious identity, their mutual communication and um, social activity and civic uh, sorry activity, how they interact with Ukrainian embassy, how they maintain cultural, social, and economic ties with Ukraine. And, and they are plans for the future. So um, the report of the research today is available in Ukrainian on our webpage. And, um, but as, as, as I know, the key findings are already translated into English and thanks to Dvinka Karcher. And they are likely to be published as soon as possible. I think till the end of the year or maybe earlier. So. As you understand, the research is mainly biased because it shows the points of view of our respondents. But as I already mentioned, in some cases, we use that analysis to avoid the bias and to ensure, uh, ensure the criteria of reliability of the study. So let us, took, uh, let us uh, take a look at the selected um, results of, of this report. Um, so the first one is the level of integration. I'll, I'll, use the, I'll use the results according to the parameters that I described. So the first one is the level of integration um, and the share of entrepreneurs among Ukrainians in South Africa. I should say that IOM's definition implies that in integration is the process by which migrants become accepted into the society, both as individuals and as groups. It refers to a two-way process of adaptation by migrants and by home so host society, which includes social inclusion and social cohesion. Social inclusion refers to migrants' gradual entry into the society, while social cohesion is an indicator how society accepts migrants. So in our research, we took into consideration all the key areas measuring economic integration in both spheres social inclusion and social cohesion. And we found that in South Africa, social cohesion conditions for Ukrainian immigrants are mostly unfavorable. Migrants usually speak about high unemployment rate and unjust labor market policy for white population like act of broad based black economic empowerment, about complicated visa policy, about work restrictions for immigrants, uh, difficult social security conditions, and so on. Obviously, this makes the process of economic integration rather complicated. But at the same time, they find conditions for starting business in South Africa more favorable than that one is Ukraine. Well, actually, depending on the aim of migration, whether it is marriage or labor, economic integration of Ukrainians in South Africa to us seems rather successful. Uh, marriage migrants usually, but not always, become housewives. Others work in private companies, especially in the sphere of information technology, medicine, finance and banking, education, different types of services and industry. However, most of Ukrainian migrants try to start their own business or work as freelancers. 
And this is actually due to the social cohesion conditions, which I already described. Thus, in this case, the share of Ukrainian entrepreneurs in South Africa is growing. Uh, also, I should admit that most Ukrainian migrants in South Africa have tertiary education or in high education, medium or sometimes high financial status, and they own different types of property. So, all these indicators and factors prove that all in all, economic integration of Ukrainian migrants to South Africa is generally favorable in terms of promotion economic cooperation between our two countries. Well, what about their identity? Our research shows that Ukrainians in South Africa have several types of national identity. Ukrainian, mixed Ukrainian and South African, South African, these are actually mostly children of Ukrainian migrants, and cosmopolitan. Participation in civic activism, formation of Ukrainian communities, celebration of Ukrainian festivals and holidays, and also Ukrainian language schools and cultural schools, all these factors have a positive effect on the preservation of Ukrainian identity in South Africa. I should also admit that Ukrainian migrants mainly find the work of Ukrainian Association and Ukrainian Embassy in South Africa really successful and effective in the spheres. Thus, the situation of preservation of national identity among Ukrainian migrants in South Africa is improving. What about the links with Ukraine? Well, links actually is a complex question which we decided into several parts. Communication with Ukrainian embassy, cultural links, social and economic. The results of our research prove that Ukrainians have a very close uh, social links with their country of origin. The respondents feel a significant need for regular communication with their friends and relatives in Ukraine. And despite long distance from South Africa to Ukraine, they regularly visit their country of origin. They also always search for news about Ukraine and um, they, uh, they try to be aware of all the events that happen in, the, in their country, actually, in Ukraine. In the economic sphere, uh, we look at migrants as those who can potentially foster trade and flows of money. Uh, so let's, let let's us take a closer look. Uh, migration and money. Some empirical studies prove positive effect of migrants on foreign direct investment attraction to their country of origin. Unfortunately, in the case of Ukrainian migration to South Africa, we haven't noticed this effect due to lack of investment flows from South Africa to Ukraine. Uh, uh, what about remittances? Well, remittances are actually one of the most analyzed phenomena in migration studies. And according to the World Bank data, remittances to Ukraine mainly grow. As in, you can see in this figure, in the year 2019, Ukraine received more than $15 billion as remittances. Unfortunately, you won't find South Africa among, among major remittances sending countries to Ukraine because the largest amount of remittances from this country to Ukraine per year totaled about 6,000 US dollars. And as you can see, yearly Ukraine receives from European countries and from other countries millions and even billions of dollars. Why is it so? Respondents of our research uh, said that they rarely send money to Ukraine and the amount they spend actually is not big. So they didn't usually have to send money regularly. On the other, and the other reason is that of low remittances to South Africa is the fact that Ukrainians prefer to bring money personally while visiting Ukraine and, and they try to avoid money transfers uh, companies because they find these services too expensive. Thus, uh, we can conclude that migration from Ukraine to South Africa doesn't have positive effect of money flows, neither in terms of investment nor in remittances. Having analyzed the answers of our respondents, we conclude that in the nearest future, the flows of remittances are unlikely to increase. Fortunately, the situation with trade is more optimistic. 
Uh, actually, we compared uh, the dynamics of migration and trade from Ukraine to South Africa for the period of the year 2000 and 2019 using the approximation method. Here you can see the picture. We got a quadratic fit with high correlation, a correlation coefficient where x it's it's an uh, independent variable and it and shows the number of Ukrainian migrants in South Africa and why a uh, dependent variable uh, it shows the exports of goods and services from Ukraine to South Africa within the analyzed period. This correlation proves that the rise in number of migrants has a positive effect on the rise in trade from Ukraine to South Africa. Well, some empirical studies say that such correlation can be explained by type of goods exported to the country of migrants' destination and by a big share of entrepreneurs among migrants who are interested in trade promotion. We have already talked about uh, entrepreneurs and that their share is, uh, is going bigger. And what about the export structure? Uh, since in the structure of Ukrainian exports to South Africa, the share of goods is much bigger than that one of services, it is obvious that exports in goods plays a dominant role in trade promotion cooperation between our two countries. In our survey, uh, as you can see from this slide, during our uh, interviews, we try to find out uh, whether whether there are Ukrainian shops in South Africa, what kinds of goods they can buy, whether they prefer to buy Ukrainian goods, and whether they, of course, would like to start trade business with Ukraine. We managed to find out that there are no specific, special Ukrainian shops in South Africa, like in other countries, for instance, Australia or European countries. So Ukrainian goods are available only in big supermarkets. Among the Ukrainian goods in South Africa, we recorded only food products like uh, wheat and flour, beans, cereals, uh, dairy products, alcohol and low alcohol drinks, animal products, and um, sweets and cookies. Uh, to avoid the bias, we compared the uh, respondents' answers with trace statistics from Ukraine to South Africa and made sure that food products really dominate in the structure of Ukrainian exports to South Africa. Well, not all, but most respondents try to buy Ukrainian products, what is also very important for future exports. But what are the main challenges for this trade situation and how can it influence the future? Since there are no special Ukrainian shops, uh, there is lack of information about Ukrainian goods in South Africa. So usually migrants simply don't know where to buy them. The other problem, irregular delivers from Ukraine. Uh, by analyzing data, we also noticed that even within the period when there was a general growth of exports from Ukraine to South Africa, some products had significant fluctuations. Such irregular delivers have also negative effect on future trade and as well as on Ukrainian good demand level, especially among native residents. Concerning uh, challenges for future trade development, Respondents think that South African native population has conservative type of consumer behavior. So it's rather difficult to send Ukrainian uh, products to non-Ukrainians, to their opinion. Uh, license for international trade is an extra burden, which increases the cost of goods and make them less compatible. Actually, some respondents generally doubt the level of quality and competitiveness of Ukrainian products on the international market. Also, they said about great need in logistic improvement so that uh, migrants in South Africa could buy Ukrainian uh, goods via internet shops. But what is more important is the fact that many respondents say that they have a huge interest in promoting trade cooperation between Ukraine and South Africa. And as you know, when there is a wish, there is a way. Uh, do they need help? Of course they do. Ukrainian migrants think, think that building an economic bridge and facilitating of business cooperation should be the priority work of Ukrainian association in South Africa. They appreciate the steps association already made in this way. Perhaps Drinka will tell more about it, yes. And they also expect support from Ukrainian embassy in South Africa as well. So as you see, the role of Ukrainian migrants in promoting trade cooperation between Ukraine and South Africa is remarkable. 
analysis of their economic integration, level of entrepreneurship, strong links with Ukraine and great desire to promote business with Ukraine only strengthen my optimistic view on this. Well, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Oksana. Uh, if you have any immediate uh, questions, please uh, raise your hand uh, and um, you can um, ask uh, uh, Oksana a question. But uh, otherwise, we will also uh, have an opportunity uh, at the end uh, of uh, all the presentations when we have a discussion uh, to, uh, to also ask them. Uh, Diana, do you want to unmute yourself? I can see you raised your hand. No, sorry, thank you. I was just clapping my hands. Congratulations. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. You can put also your uh, questions uh, in the chat and um, uh, we will be able to uh, address them um, uh, at the end of the uh, conference. And I'm very happy to uh, introduce our next speaker, Stefan Shevchuk. Uh, and uh, Stefan is the person behind the Police Association of uh, Siberian uh, Deportees and um, uh, has been uh, uh, also co-organizer of this uh, event. Uh, Stefan, do you want to yeah. mute yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Javinka. Right. Let me just get my presentation up. Okay. Uh, oh my word, I've forgotten how to share it. Can you believe it? Um, uh, Stefan is also organizing um, a conference um, um, on, the, uh, on Polish uh, Polish community in the, uh, South Africa, especially those uh, uh, who were orphans uh, that came to uh, South Africa uh, during the Second World okay. War. Right. Yeah, you can see the presentation, okay, Stefan. Just go to the share um, mode. All right, good. No. Yes, no. Um, are you able to see my presentation? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Um, yes. The title of my presentation is uh, This Afternoon Polonia Diaspora, a Historical and Modern Perspective. Um, and uh, by way of introduction, um, I'm president of the Polish Association of the Siberian Deportees in Africa, <clears throat> vice president of the Polish Heritage Foundation of South Africa, and for my sons, I'm a PhD candidate in history at the University of Witwatersrand. And uh, my first career was as a scientist and I retired in 2018 from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. And what I thought I would um, show is almost like the end of the presentation, but at the beginning, because uh, one of the um, major events coming up later this year is the unveiling of a stained glass, uh, a series of stained glass panels at the uh, Black Madonna uh, Chapel in Otsuan. The Black Madonna icon uh, and uh, Kobus uh, referred to the Polish children of Otsuan. This is one of the legacies that uh, the Polish children of Otsuan have left behind is the Black Madonna icon. It's a revered icon. Um, the original is in the, the town of Shastachowa in, in Poland. And um, 2018, September 2018, we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the arrival of the Polish children into Otsuan. And uh, we had about 120 people attend. Uh, we had 15 uh, Siberian deportees, a number of second, uh, third generationers. And consensus was reached that uh, we should also leave behind a legacy. And the legacy project turned out to be these four uh, stained glass panels. Initially, the plan was to have unveiled it uh, September last year. Uh, that unfortunately didn't happen, but uh, we could uh, we we took the opportunity uh, the break in, uh, in in the COVID restrictions to nevertheless um, install the uh, the panels in the, in the cathedral. But uh, this year September uh, indications are looking good that we'll be able to um, go down to Oatsman and uh, unveil this uh, these uh, stained glass panels officially. All right now. I think one of the challenges is Kubis has um, given you much of my presentation, um, but I'll try and um, add more to what Kubis uh, has described. 
Yeah, look, the um, Polish peoples, uh, they are described as Polonians, and basically you know, it describes the worldwide community of people of Polish ancestry and the Polish diaspora. The Polish diaspora is one of the largest in the world, if not the largest, and it is estimated that uh, approximately 50% of people of Polish origin live outside of Poland. And with the Poland's current uh, population of approximately 38 million, the diaspora is approximately uh, 20 million. And this is mainly as a consequence of Poland's turbulent history, including voluntary migrations. The USA has the largest uh, number of uh, Polonians of about 10 million. The largest numbers are in uh, New York and Chicago. And I was trying to, conf trying to confirm what I was told years ago that um, Chicago at one stage had more polls than Warsaw. Um, I, I, I couldn't find any information to verify that, 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 uh, that, uh, that bit of information. But anyway, but uh, the US has the largest number of uh, Polonians. And um, as you can see on the map on the, on the, on the right-hand side, yeah, the, the, the Polonians are spread out all over the show with the largest um, number of uh, Polonians living in uh, South Africa. Now, often I have, you know, the, the, I have to feel the questions in terms of how many poles of Polonians are there in South Africa? And I've yet to find a reliable figure. A lot of it is just estimates. And um, this is further complicated by the South African census where there's, there's, there's no request in terms of ethnicity, in terms of, you know, are you uh, Polish, Russian, uh, English or whatever? but mainly of race, black, white, uh, colored, uh, and so on. And there are estimates of between 10 to 35,000 uh, uh, poles in South Africa. And I seriously question those figures. Um, you know, it's like, you know, having done, having you know, my first career as a scientist, you know, you, 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 unless you see evidence, you're not going to uh, accept it. And then further, one can ask the question, do these figures include the Polish Jews? Right, in South Africa, the largest concentrations of Polonians are in uh, the Gauteng province. It's in South Africa's industrial and commercial hub, and it's also the smallest of the South African provinces. The second largest concentration is in the Cape Town metropolitan area, and the third largest is in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, KZN. And then uh, uh, Polonians are spread all over South Africa. All right, now the history of Polonian migration in to, to South Africa. And um, much of the uh, information is based on uh, publications by Professor Arkadiusz Szukowski, Dr. Marius Kowalski, and uh, Witold uh, Jakutowicz, who's um, a second generation. Uh, his mother was uh, a Serbian deportee, and I accessed his, uh, his thesis. And, um, and I think a lot of it is um, much has been mentioned by, by Kurbis, but the first traces of Poles in South Africa was during the Portuguese sea voyages of discovery to India in the late 1400s. And the first Pole to actually set foot on South African soil was a person by the name of Gaspar da Gama in 1499. Uh, that is not his real name. It was a name given to him. He was an orphan um, and uh, he was just given that name of Gaspar da Gama. Now Gaspar is a Polish Jew born in Poznan but converted to Catholicism and he was an interpreter and a guide to several fleets of the Portuguese maritime explorations. And Gaspar was the pilot for Vasco da Gama's fleet when Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope. Now this expedition followed the pioneering expedition of Bartholomew Dias who rounded the Cape of Good Hope in uh, 1488. I think also one should remember that uh, the Cape of Good Hope often is also called the Cape of Storms. Uh, there's some massive storms in that part of the world. So travel by sea was a bit, uh, was a bit traumatic. Now thereafter, there were transit connections with the South African coast when Polish missionaries, merchants, traders, adventurers, and seamen sailed from Europe around the Cape of Good Hope to India and the Far East. Now in 1602, the Dutch established the Dutch East India Company in uh, Dutch, the uh, acronym is VOC. And it was established to trade with India in the Far East. And uh, Poles were employed by this company. In 1652, the VOC instructed Jan van Riebeck to establish a supply and labor port at the Cape of Good Hope. And Jan van Riebeck was accompanied by a Pole from Gdańska, Pavel Petkov. 
Now, the VOC occupied the Cape Colony from 1652 until 1806, when the Cape Colony became a British colony. And once again, yeah, just to, to reiterate, the VOC employed a number of Poles who, who eventually also settled and established families in the Cape Colony. Now, many of these Polish descendants assimilated into the merging of the kind of work community. And uh, um, Kubis has given an example of uh, uh, a captain who's uh, uh, a referee. But uh, an example of a well-known Afrikaner surname of Polish roots is Mayer and, and originates from Andreas Mayer from Gdansk, who was born in 1748. Now, another example of a well-known African surname of Polish roots is Rus. And this has been confirmed by a friend of mine whose uh, father was uh, also uh, one of the Polish children in Otsuan. And on researching her mother's ancestry, she confirmed that Rus is of Polish origin. Now, details of Polish migration to South Africa during the 1800s is not clear. And the question can be asked, is this as a consequence of the partitions and colonization of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth by the Russian-Prussian um, Austrian Empire during the late 1700s? And if so, any Polish migrants to South Africa would have been classified uh, Russia or German. And on the map on the right-hand side, you can get a sense of the extent of the various uh, imperial um, empires, the Russian, German, Austrian, and Ottoman empires. All right, this is just I'm not going to go into three de detail um, in the, on these two tables, but uh, basically, if you look at table one on the left hand side, these are ancestors of worse families originating from the Polish territories. And here you can see number 12 is Andreas Mayer, and, um, a, uh, uh, and then another well known surname in South African, uh, particularly in politics, is Mulder. Is, uh, uh, Jakob Saul Müller, who came out from uh, from uh, um, uh, Poland. And then on the right hand side, there's a list of uh, names who have possible uh, associated links with the Polish family. And uh, as you can see, uh, there were a number of um, uh, people of Polish origin who settled in the Cape. I think it's important to note the, the the dates that they arrived, and that was in the from literally soon after the arrival of uh, Jan van Rubeck, 1662, all the way up to 1818. All right, so the bit of South African history. The 1800s history of South Africa is characterized by Afrikaner dissatisfaction in the Cape Colony under British rule, the Great Trek, the establishment of two independent Boer republics of the Transvaal and the Orish Free State, the discovery of golds and uh, diamond, and this discovery of mineral wealth in the interior of South Africa attracted the attention of the British colonizers and with it the might of the British military forces. And then there's a couple of questions that can be asked is, were there families of Polish origin who participated in the above mentioned historical events? Um, probably that, that uh, is uh, hopefully a, a project for a student to, to, to uh, research. Now, during the South African War, okay, it was originally known as the Anglo-Boer War um, uh, between 1899 and 1902, between the Boer Republics and uh, Britain, a contingent of Polish force, uh, soldiers fought on the side of the, Boer, in the Boers. Now, two well-known Boer commanders in this war are Generals Jan Smuts and Louis, Louis Boerter, and um, try and explain why I'm mentioning their names. And the question can be asked, did Jan Smuts and Louis Boerter come into contact with the Polish soldiers? And if so, how much, uh, how, how did such contact influence the attitudes of Jan Smuts and Louis Boerter towards the Polish people? And um, after World War I, a whole bunch of nation states re-emerged in Central and Eastern Europe, the Baltics and the Balkans, after the collapse of the Russian German, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires, and these countries regain the independence and sovereignty. Now, there is a bit of a, a certain link and a connection to the emergence of these uh, uh, new uh, uh, um, states, nation states. In 1919, General Wojtek traveled to Europe to mediate a military alliance between Józef uh, Pulsudski of Poland and Simon uh, Petluria of, of Ukraine. And uh, you know, the question can be asked, you know, what, um, what, was, he, what, what was his impressions um, of his uh, visits to Poland and Ukraine? 
Now, the immigration from the Second Republic, by the Second Republic, 1918 to 1939, to Serbia consisted mostly of Polish Jews. And uh, these Polish Jews actively took part in South African economic, social, and cultural life and became well known businessmen, tradesmen, inventors, and civil servants. And in fact, a number of these Jews ended up in the town of Otsuan and um, you know, um, um, made uh, quite a bit of money in the ostrich feather trade. Now, the um, 500 Polish children and the caregivers, survivors of the Russian um, 1940 to 1941 deportations um, to Siberia, they arrived in the Otsuan camp on the 10th of April 1943. And uh, yeah, both of my parents are two of these children. The then Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa, Field Marshal Jan Smuts, granted permission for these Polish children and their caregivers to find safety and refuge in South Africa. And once again, the questions can be asked, now, did Jan Smuts' encounters with the Polish soldiers in the South African war and we worked his experiences in Poland and Ukraine influence a humanitarian attitude towards the Polish children of Otsu and accepting them into South Africa. Now, these Polish children of Otsu, together with other deputies from other refugee camps in Eastern and Southern Africa, including other World War II refugees, went on to form the current core of the Polish community in South Africa. In 1948, these Polish deportees established the Polish Settlers Association of South Africa. My father, Jan Schaftrup, was a founder, mother, was a founder mem member. Now, this association eventually evolved into the Johannesburg Polish Association. After World War II, after demobilization, a number of Polish military personnel settled in South Africa. Um, I'm still trying to find out how many settled. I've seen figures ranging from 12,000 to 1,200, and I question those numbers seriously. Now, those military personnel who married deportees went on to be active in the Polish community. And um, sadly, those military personnel who married South African women were to a large extent lost, lost to the Polish community. Um, occasionally, some, well, you know, one of the offspring of, uh, let's say, a Polish father or a South, and a South African mother may get, get in touch with me um, to, to, to try and reestablish their, their links with uh, Poland and, and its culture. Now, uh, to counter political opposition to Russian imposed communist rule in Poland, the Polish government um, imposed martial law and a military junta from 13th of December 1981 to the 22nd of July 1983. During martial law, a number of Poles, professional people mostly, managed to escape from the highly restricted uh, Poland to settle in South Africa. Many of these Poles, uh, in fact, they ended up uh, settling in uh, Ferenichen, Van der Bell Park, and Sasselberg, uh, where you have um, you know, the Sassel um, Cold II uh, 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 liquid fuel uh, facility, as well as uh, ISCO, that was in Van der Bell. Um, and um, over the years, I've managed to get to know a number of these people that, uh, that uh, escaped uh, during martial law. Now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, most of the Warsaw Pact countries, including Poland, regained their independence and sovereignty. And the Third Polish Republic was established in 1989 as a democratic state ruled by law. And this change in status of Poland, as well as abolishment of apartheid in South Africa, has resulted in the free movement of people, capital, and goods and trade between South Africa and Poland. Now, the framework of cooperation between Poland and South Africa is defined by an inter intergovernmental agreement on economic cooperation signed in October 2013. An economic partnership agreement, the EPA, include, concluded on the 10th of June 2016. There was a number of other agreements, sectoral agreements and MOUs, including scientific agreements between Poland and South Africa. Now, South Africa is the most important economic partner of, of Poland, a positive balance in bilateral trade. Now, another friend of mine, a second generation, whose father was in Ozun, van der Chanet, she did a PhD thesis uh, entitled A Model for the Utilization of Networks and Leveraging of the Economic Benefits of Migration Capital in Emerging Markets. And here she discussed the role of involuntary Polish migrant entrepreneurs, namely Siberian deportees, in sustaining in establishing sustainable businesses in the South African economy. Now, many of the uh, uh, Polish deportees uh, yeah, ended up uh, 
being entrepreneurs and, and establishing uh, viable businesses. Now, from a cultural, historical, and heritage uh, side of things, now what is what, what's happening in South Africa as far as that, and even maintaining, <clears throat> trying to maintain identities. And um, here, yeah, there are a number of, uh, of uh, institutions, organisations that are active. Um, firstly, yeah, you have the Polish Embassy in Pretoria, who hosts cultural and commemorative events for the Polish community, and um, they also undertake consulate duties in Pretoria, Cape Town, Durban, and Port Elizabeth. And then there's the Polish Catholic Church in Norwich, Johannesburg, offers Mass in Polish on Sundays. And they also host cultural and commemorative events for the Polish community. And then you know, the Polish Heritage Foundation of South Africa, the custodian of the South African Polish uh, Cultural, Historical and Heritage Archives, and also the custodian of the Polish section of the West Park Cemetery in Johannesburg. And then the Warsaw Flights Commemoration Committee, they organize annual events in September. The, um, uh, at the Katya Memorial to commemorate the South African airmen who participated in the dropping of supplies over Warsaw during the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. And then there's a whole range of Paris Association, Cape Town, Janus, Victoria, Vault Triangle, KwaZulu Natal. And these associations maintain uh, email databases, web pages, and Facebook pages to inform the respective members of developments and events in the communities. And in Cape Town, a Polish priest offers mass for the Polish community. Right, there are three schools in Pretoria, Johannesburg and Cape Town that uh, teach uh, the Polish language. Stefan, Stefan yes. we are running out of time. Uh, just uh, do you think you are at the end of the presentation? Okay. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the last one, but uh, yeah, then yeah, I'll, I'll uh, quickly finish this one and I'll skip the last page. Yeah, then there's the Polish Africans Facebook page of 2,100 members. And then, yeah, then of course, there's the Polish Association of Sarbeni Deportees that was established in 2006. But uh, yeah, I think um, just uh, to mention that uh, we have three themes. Uh, in fact, uh, what Fukubis um, uh, should have mentioned is that uh, uh, he and I, we established the South African Poland History Project that was uh, is officially rec registered at the Salt Lake University. And we undertake uh, various um, uh, projects, legacy projects, cultural and academic projects. And, I've, um, and then, in fact, one of the upcoming events is the 8th South Africa Poland History Conference that is scheduled for Sunday, the 14th of November. And the bottom right is the picture where I've described. All right, I'll leave it there. Seeing as we're out of time. Thanks a lot, Stefan. I think we've got the in-depth uh, understanding of um, the uh, Polish uh, institutions and also the uh, migration processes. Uh, in the, uh, from Poland to uh, South Africa. Are there any immediate uh, questions to uh, Stefan? If you have a question, you can either put it in the chat or to raise your hand, uh, but we will also have um, at the uh, time, hopefully at the end of discussion. Uh, and. Uh, and we can see the words of appreciation to uh, Stefan. Thanks for your presentation. Um, we can move to the, the next speaker. And uh, I'm very happy to present uh, Dr. Monica Popescu and uh, Stefan Tsibian from uh, Fagaras Research Institute in um, Romania. And um, um, they both research uh, um, the connections between uh, Romania and um, uh, South Africa. Uh, Stefan is uh, also a researcher of uh, Chatham House and uh, was uh, in South Africa, um, uh, hosted by uh, South African Institute of International Affairs, uh, SIA, and done a comp comprehensive report on those relationships between sub-Saharan uh, countries and uh, um, Eastern European countries. So those who are interested, you can um, follow the uh, Chatham House uh, research paper. Thank you. And I know Monica also um, uh, research in the literature and um, uh, other um, areas of cooperation between South Africa and uh, Eastern European countries. Thank Stephen, you. Stefan, if you can stop sharing the uh, screen. I don't know if you, Monica and uh, Stefan, if you want to um, share also your screen. Yeah. I can yeah. also 
say that Stefan uh, was uh, critical in putting us in touch uh, with researchers uh, from a few other countries. So thanks a lot. And we hope that this cooperation will uh, continue. Yes. Um, we are having a little bit of a problem with the with the sharing, um, which we didn't anticipate. Um, Maybe we can just start and see if we can uh, fix this as we go. So thank you so much, uh, Dvinka, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Stefan uh, Chibian, and together with my colleague Monique Popescu, we prepared a presentation on uh, Romania's relations with uh, South Africa. Um, well, I, I really want to start by thanking you very much for uh, for the invitation to to join this conference and to to think a little bit more in depth about the relations between Romania and South Africa. Uh, both uh, Monica and myself are looking at the relations between uh, Central Eastern Europe and, and Africa, and uh, it is great to uh, to narrow down and focus on the South African Romanian relations. Uh, we are in process of doing so. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, we have put together um, a small presentation on um, uh, maybe the historical, some historical aspects related to the relations between South Africa and Romania, and um, a few aspects related to where we are today in the in the um, in this relationship. Um, I myself am um, based at the Fogaraj Research Institute, and I mainly focus on um, international relations and international development. Um, and um, as, as uh, Zvinka mentioned, um, I have been looking uh, more recently at the re-emerging relations between Central and Eastern European countries, as well um, as um, at the Im impact of the new newer EU member countries, which um, most of them come from this uh, Central and Eastern European uh, region. Uh, so the impact of these uh, countries on the broader EU-Africa relations. Um, so um, in a nutshell, that um, is a little bit about myself. I will invite also my colleague Monica to say a few words about herself and we will then move on to the presentation. Um, Stefan, if you, uh, sorry not to interrupt you, but if you want to email the presentation, I can help with uh, oh, sharing. Oh yeah, that would be fantastic. That would we be can fantastic. We can, we can do that. Um, I can do that while okay. Monica okay. presents. Yes. Um, and um, I uh, am a professor at McGill University. I'm actually in a different field than I think most of the presenters today um, as I work on, on literature. And I'm the author of um, a book on South African literature beyond the Cold War, which looks at the role of, South Af uh, of uh, Eastern Europe in the South African cultural imaginary and also um, a book um, on um, Cold War literature in, um, in Africa. Um, so I'm going to start presenting and um, I, I think uh, Stefan has just emailed you our PowerPoint. Um, so if you could um, let us know when, uh, when, you, have, um, when you have it. Um, as soon as it arrives, I'll start sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we want to start by talking a little bit about um, the historical turning point um, in 1989 and 1990, where both um, Romania and South Africa um, started to open up towards um, processes of um, democratization. Uh, in the case of South Africa, of course, um, uh, through a process of uh, transformation. And uh, thank you, that, that's fantastic. Um, so if you can move to the first uh, slide, that would be fantastic. I'm, I'm so sorry to, uh, to have to ask you to uh, move the slides forward. Um, so in the, um, uh, in the case of um, South Africa, a process of uh, post-colonial um, transformation, uh, both in terms of in internal colonialism, but also the legacy of, um, of older uh, colonial powers, especially the relationship with, the, with Britain. And in the case of, of Romania, um, the socialistic um, relationship of this complex relationship with the and, uh, and the Soviet Union, while uh, on the enters of Egypt during the apartheid regime, uh, were um, very much inspired by the dissident writers in um, in the Eastern European uh, writer uh, in the Eastern European countries. Um, uh, for instance, um, Cesu Miosh was uh, was a figure that was was very much um, uh, admired. Um, the Romanian writer Ana Blandiana, um, likewise. 
Um, and the third kind of like um, aspect of this complex relationship between the, the two countries um, is the um, image that um, uh, that the government, the South African government was trying to, um, to promote, namely that countries in Eastern Europe were totalitarian regimes, um, atheist societies, um, and they were using Eastern Europe basically as ideological foe for the, for the apartheid um, uh, regime. Uh, Zwinka, if we could forward, thank you so much. Um, so I want to quickly talk about two examples of um, uh, connections between the two countries, but looking at South Africans who visited or lived in, in Romania. I mentioned earlier that there were people who came on scholarships um, to, to Romania. And a good example of this is um, Victor Motapaniane, who got a PhD in anthropology from the University of Bucharest. And over a period of 15 years, he contributed to the development of the, the field of cultural um, anthropology in Romania. Um, he published um, a lot of articles on the, the change of values, especially family values um, in rural and urban um, populations in areas that were going through a process of industrialization and um, uh, urbanization. And another, um, moment of, of contact between Romanian and South African populations were festivals and, um, and exchanges. And one of the most famous um, South Africans, um, Walter Sisulu, came to, to Romania in 1953. He was part of a, a delegation of South African youth um, who participated in the, the first World Youth Festival, which was held in 1953 in, in Romania. Um, and if you can please um, forward to the, to the next uh, slide. I put here two quotations from Walter Sisulu's um, memoir, I Will Go Singing. And the first one is of um, the, the aspects that he, he liked about the, the country. I visited state farms and factories and was shown various development projects, women engineers working hard. I went to the countryside and I met peasants every night we were in meetings and usually seated with important persons such as cabinet ministers um, at the same meeting or show. The music especially thrilled me, all types of music. The evidence of folk culture was tremendous. All this was part of the festival. The food was excellent, usually five courses, and they kept piling it, um, uh, piling it on. So that the typical kind of um, um, Eastern European hospitality that we see here. But what I also find really interesting is um, this interest in the development of, uh, of industry, the transformation of an agra agrarian society uh, as Romania was before the Second um, World War into an industrialized country. And while, of course, the, we could say quite a lot about what was happening in, in Romania in the 1950s, namely a lot of people were deported um, and forced labor camps, and uh, definitely there was no kind of opening of society in, in democratic um, terms. Um, it, it's interesting to also take Sisulu on his own terms to see what he was seeing there as, as um, possible connections between Romania and South Africa. Um, and the second excerpt that um, I have here is, is more jarring um, because um, it, it pertains to quite a shocking experience. At the first station stop when, when the delegation came from um, Czechoslovakia, uh, many people were excited to see her, um, namely Lindy Kagane, a member of the delegation, touching her and her hair. One of the Romanians asked her, are you a um, K-word? Uh, and Lindy explained the term and why it was not used. Um, the person concerned was ashamed and apologized profusely. On the station platform, we found the traditional circle with singing and dancing, the throwing of handkerchiefs, pulling and pushing and even kissing. Um, so beyond the kind of ethnographic in, uh, interest on both, both sides, um, what we see here is one of the darker aspects of the, of the connection between Eastern European countries and, um, and South Africa, namely uh, racism and uh, racial typecasting. Um, and while Sisulu glances uh, um, 
pretty quick quickly over um, over this this incident, and I'm actually trying to figure out even what the Romanian could have used, what term could have used, because there's no equivalent in Romanian that I could possibly imagine. Uh, obviously, right, that that um, that racializing incident is 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 quite uh, jarring, and it's something that. Uh, researchers have focused on uh, more recently about the experiences of, um, of Black South Africans and, and um, also Africans from other parts of the continent in, um, in Eastern Europe. So I'll stop here and I'll pass on um, to, uh, to Stefan. Thank you, Monica. Dvinka, please, if we can move forward. So um, this, uh, uh, well, the experiences that Monica presented um, are obviously uh, taking place in a, in a context um, um, of, the, of the communist regime and the relationship that exists at that time. Um, and um, now we, uh, we can move a little bit forward and uh, we can see the 1990s as a period of, um, um, well, initial engagement, then probably um, less engagement and then um, hopefully we'll see more engagement in the future. Um, so while um, uh, in, the, in the initial period of the 1990s, Romania paid attention to South Africa and there was a period when uh, diplomatic uh, relations were, uh, were established, etc. Uh, thereafter, Romania uh, focused uh, its attention mainly on joining the UN NATO. And uh, this um, uh, basically took away uh, Romania's attention to African countries in general, including South Africa. Um, Romania did join NATO in 2004 and the EU in 2007. Um, unfortunately, the interest in uh, African countries is only slowly uh, re-emerging. So we do see a period of um, rather uh, less interest, let's say, from the Romanian side. Um, now, um, uh, while um, Romania has a lower interest in general in um, besides NATO and, and the EU, um, we do see that from among the African countries, Romania holds a, a higher interest in Northern Africa and South Africa. South Africa is one of the, uh, main, well, it's obviously the main partner uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Also, if, you look, if we look at trade relations, um, and trade, in essence, is uh, is a driver for Romania's engagement with African countries, uh, trade, investment, and uh, security issues. So, Zvinka, please, if we can move forward. Okay, uh, if we are to focus further on uh, re uh, Romania's relations with South Africa, these were established in early 1990s, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, also we see a, a set of higher level visits in the early 90s, and I, um, I don't think we have uh, seen um, such higher level visits since, unfortunately. So um, uh, currently, um, most meetings are rather uh, within the margins of the UN General Assembly, probably a situation that is um, uh, similar for some of the other Central and Eastern European countries. Um, and um, we are um, in a moment of uh, re-emergence in general of relations between Central and Eastern European countries and, um, and um, African countries and pr primarily South Africa. Uh, South Africa is a country on the continent um, alongside Ethiopia uh, with most uh, presence, diplomatic presence from, uh, from Central and Eastern European countries. Um, so um, uh, basically um, diplomats on all sides do see a lot of potential in developing relations. Um, um, however, I think we are still to see uh, how this potential is turned into reality. Uh, uh, Romania and South Africa has memoranda of understanding on uh, trade, obviously now being part of the EU, the situation has changed, but also on education, arts and culture, science and technology and defense. We have seen a number of um, uh, emerging uh, context between universities, which I think is uh, extremely important. And more recently, um, South Africa held the presidency of the AU, Romania held the presidency of the Council of the EU. Um, also, um, um, Romania um, had um, has a number of um, uh, a few uh, uh, embassies, African embassies, 
in Bucharest, and uh, there are such meetings with uh, with the ambassadors. Um, and also in 2019, we had the uh, ACPEU Interparliamentary Assembly taking place in Romania. So there were in the last, uh, uh, in around 2019, uh, there has been um, an increasing num uh, number of opportunities to, mm -hmm. um, to, um, to take things forward at this um, uh, diplomatic uh, level. Uh, we can move forward. Um, Nevertheless, for both um, Romania and South Africa, probably the, the key um, aspect uh, of interest uh, are economic relations. So we can see uh, the evolution of trade between Romania and South Africa. Uh, now, obviously, we see some ups and downs. Uh, these are um, indicated uh, mainly by the crisis in 2010-11 um, and now the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, but in general, we do see a growing trend. Um, we can move forward. Uh, we can see that, um, in essence, Romania's um, exports to South Africa are, um, are actually giving this trend um, as, um, as they have been increasing over the years. And uh, I think how we can move forward. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, we can see that um, uh, the countries um, have some relevance in terms of trade for each other, but um, there is obviously a lot of potential that is uh, that is yet uh, to be to be tapped into. We can move forward. Um, now, um, besides trade of investment is actually quite an interesting area to look into, um, and uh, this is really more about South African investments in Romania, which has really have really been increasing significantly in the last couple of years. Uh, we see quite a lot of, of attention uh, paid by um, uh, South African investors in uh, to Romania, especially in the field of real estate and malls, but also um, we can look at uh, online platforms. Um, for a while, the beer the industry and so on. Um, Nepi uh, Rock Castle is one of the one of the major players um, in real estate and malls in Romania, um, and we're talking about investments of, of a couple of billion uh, euros. Um, now there is um, uh, just one more uh, uh, just one more point here. Um, there uh, the potential for uh, investment in Romania is uh, is appreciated to be good, especially in the mining, agriculture, services, education, and financial sector. Thank you. I think we can uh, go on. Um, now, um, as, as Monica mentioned, we are now uh, reaching out for um, more information on the Romanian community in South Africa. So we will be uh, building um, a further in this direction, but um, we do, as, as Monica illustrated, see that uh, the exchanges at the community level, at the society level between uh, the two countries go back um, several decades. Um, and um, we have had a wave of migration of Romanians towards South Africa in early 90s. Um, now, uh, that uh, wave of uh, migration was followed by, um, by migration of, of the Romanians from South Africa further towards Australia and New Zealand and other countries. So uh, while we um, um, have had um, a few thousand Romanians living in South Africa uh, in the early 90s, probably this number is significantly down at the moment. Um, um, there is obviously also a potential for further developing people-to-people -people relations through university exchanges, scholarships, uh, research grants, tourism, and cultural relations. Um, both countries have quite um, quite significant um, atouts in this uh, in all these areas, and um, um, obviously the Romanian community in South Africa can play an important role in in all of this. If we can move forward as conclusion. Um, Obviously, uh, there is um, a space to, to further explore this mutual interest in, uh, among the two countries. Um, South Africa is also a strategic uh, partner for the EU. Um, and um, given Romania's uh, slowly, but luckily increasing interest in, in African countries, South Africa is obviously an important partner for um, reaching even further uh, if, uh, in the continent. Um, uh, which is probably not an easy task for all of the Central and Eastern European countries. And here, uh, probably this can be an, a really important role that 
um, um, Eastern European um, um, communities in South Africa can actually contribute towards, uh, because it seems that uh, countries in our region do struggle significantly to be present or to reconnect to, to African countries. Um, now, in terms of, uh, while the potential is there also uh, to take this relationship further in political and economic terms, uh, and uh, community terms or social uh, society terms uh, as well. Um, obviously, uh, there is a need, a significant need for institutional support. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think that um, uh, this is a, an area to, to, to further uh, explore for the two countries. Um, uh, because um, while we have um, a small community of Romanians in South Africa, actually the level of awareness among the two countries is actually extremely low. Uh, this potential, I mean, we're talking about potential, what does this potential mean? In political and, uh, uh, and development terms, uh, there are in interesting transition experiences in both, part, in both countries, and there is a lot of potential for learning actually in both directions. Um, that can be uh, exploited. Um, it is at the at the, uh, well. It is probably at the minimum at the moment, and much more can happen. In economic terms, I've already mentioned there are certain uh, sectors like mining, uh, agriculture, services, education, financial sector, tourism, which are um, sectors where there can be a lot more uh, going on. Um, uh, also, on the security front, given also the increasing security risks uh, that are um, extremely seen, extremely important by the EU uh, proliferation of um, extremist groups in uh, several conflicts uh, uh, in the continent. Um, uh, probably there is a lot of space also for collaboration in that direction. Um, and uh, without doubt, the community of Romanians in South Africa can uh, could play an important role in, in all of this. So thank you so much. Um, we're looking forward to continuing this discussion. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Monica, and thanks, uh, Stefan. Um, I think we are running uh, 15 uh, minutes late, but if you have uh, any immediate questions, we'll um, take them now. Thanks for widening um, our conversation so significantly to include the literature and the international cooperation. Um, and uh, I hope that we will uh, be able to talk because we really have a big diversity of topics. We went from, from, from economic cooperation to diving into specific immigration of uh, um, the Polish community between from Poland to uh, South Africa. And now we've uh, looked uh, a little bit on Romania community, but uh, also on the other links uh, beyond the community. I'm very happy to uh, present uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, Professor uh, Nikolai Vukov uh, from uh, Institute of Ethnology and Folklore Studies with uh, Ethnographic Museum, Bulgarian Academy of uh, Sciences. And uh, we've uh, uh, met uh, Nikolai through a very active uh, Bulgarian school in uh, uh, Cape Town, uh, you know, that uh, school, uh, the Nikolai has came to uh, research uh, Bulgarian community in South Africa just before the lockdown. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for being today and for sharing your research. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure being part of this event and uh, warm um, greetings to the organizers for setting it up. Um, and I'm really very happy also to, to take up the floor from uh, my Romanian uh, colleagues uh, uh, and uh, uh, tracing links that uh, can be found as similarities uh, between Bulgaria and Romania, neighboring countries with uh, um, very similar in some ways um, waves of immigration uh, abroad after the end of the communist period. Uh, indeed, um, uh, I uh, was part of a research um, uh, a trip uh, days before the lockdown uh, last year, uh, just less than a week uh, before the beginning of uh, this the lockdown with the pandemic. Um, and with a colleague of mine, Shteru Shterev, uh, uh, we traveled to uh, South Africa in late uh, February and the first days of March uh, um, uh, last year. Uh, 
in an attempt to, to trace the contours of uh, the Bulgarian presence in South Africa, the um, existence of Bulgarian community, the immigration processes, uh, traditions, cultural heritage maintained by um, our co-nationals, uh, immigrant institutions, uh, etc. So uh, just, I hope uh, the screen is visible and shared you can you yes. can see it. Oh, we can okay. see it, Nikolai. And also, uh, you, if you can stick to twenty minutes, that would be yes, amazing. Yes, I will be. I will try to be as <laughs> really as strict as possible, and I hope to be. Um, so you. we had this field uh, field work research within a project of cultural heritage and uh, institu institutionalization of Bulgarian historical and contemporary immigrant communities. And beyond Europe, uh, a project at uh, my institute, Institute of Ethnology and Folklore Studies with Ethnographic Museum at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. And we had a, a really very generous uh, support from the National Science Fund of the Ministry of Education and Science of the Republic of Bulgaria. Uh, during the field work, um, uh, which this was our first visit uh, to the country, uh, we had the chance to uh, visit um, uh, Bulgarians uh, in the cities of Cape Town, Johannesburg, um, uh, Pretoria, and uh, Midrand, uh, visited some of the institutions of uh, um, uh, Bulgarians in South Africa, had meetings and uh, interviews uh, um, of, uh, with Bulgarian immigrants, and also observed the activities, some of the activities at the Bulgarian Cultural Center in uh, Midrand. So this is also a, a chance to, to uh, express uh, um, my gratitude and the gratitude of my uh, colleague with whom we traveled uh, to South Africa, to our respond, all our respondents during the field mission and also to the empl employees at the Embassy of the Rep Republic of Bulgaria in South Africa, who provided us really with support and logistical assistance during their research uh, visit. Uh, let me uh, say several introductory words about the presence of Bulgarians in South Africa. It's a case of re relatively new immigration formed exclusively after 1989 as a result of several immigration uh, waves within uh, mostly two decades. Um, and the initial cases of um, uh, turning South Africa into immigrant destinations uh, for Bulgarians was in the beginning of 1990s when there was a visible uh, um, attention, and, uh, attention and um, a series of cases of uh, uh, Bulgarians who were um, leaving uh, the country and setting uh, um, in South Africa. Um, particularly the, the first peak was in 1992, 1993, which was the generation of the first uh, of the uh, uh, post-socialist transition, the first years of the post-socialist transition. And the, in these first years, I actually, the, the, there was also the case of uh, um, uh, establishing uh, uh, diplomatic relationships with uh, between Bulgaria and South Africa, opening uh, Bulgarian embassy in Pretoria. And also at the, the, in those years, there was a regular flight uh, connection, um, daily flights <laughs> between Sofia and Johannesburg, which uh, uh, by itself, it uh, says, says a lot about this uh, um, um, interaction uh, and uh, also um, immigration. Uh, uh, trips uh, of Bulgarians uh, to, to this uh, country. Uh, in the 90s, uh, um, as a result of uh, this uh, immigration wave, um, there was um, uh, there are suppositions that uh, the number of Bulgarians who uh, settled in uh, South Africa was uh, uh, over 20,000, some uh, um, uh, opinions are that it reached even 50,000 uh, 50, people. Um, immigrants uh, uh, were uh, settled mostly in the largest cities, uh, particularly Johannesburg, and, but later there was there could be traced uh, uh, a flow inside the country from Johannesburg to Cape Town, forming uh, a relatively big uh, presence of uh, Bulgarians in this uh, um, um, in this city. Uh, 
there is also a case, uh, a process of uh, diminishing or decreasing the presence of, Bulgar uh, of Bulgarians in South Africa in the past decades, and uh, respondents uh, usually share factors such as insecurity, rise of in unemployment, in economic difficulties, and social tensions. And there is also a case of uh, remigration re to other destinations such as Australia, New Zealand, Canada, European countries. So cases of once being an immigrant, always an immigrant uh, in uh, some of the stories, uh, but also their um, uh, families, uh, particularly of the first immigration generation who returned to Bulgaria and settled um, after two or three decades uh, life uh, uh, in uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, in terms of specifics or some contours, really a very general sketch about uh, the um, um, Bulgarians' uh, uh, presence in South Africa. So as I said, it's relatively new immigration formed uh, pretty recently, uh, several immigration waves, but also recent outflow. Uh, very important point is that it's a dispersed community with relatively low level of contacts and interaction among, interactions among uh, co-nationals. And a very striking point related to the lack of reliable statistics about the number of Bulgarians in the country, such uh, statistics or such data, uh, despite our efforts, we uh, were not able so far to, uh, to, 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 to gather and to, to really point out. Uh, there, there, are really, there are really serious variations in numbers, but generally as a speculation, it's supposed that nowadays there are around around 3,000 to 4,000 Bulgarians in the country with uh, about uh, 1,000 people living in uh, Cape Town and approximately 3,000 people living in Pretoria and Johannesburg. Uh, the, an important point is that the community is not concentrated in neighborhoods, but lives in different parts of the city, which makes it even more difficult to maintain contacts in between. And in a, a series of following slides, I'm just showing uh, photos uh, gathered during our um, field work, but putting an emphasis on the institutions. So here, um, in, uh, with regards to Cape Town, uh, to um, emblematic institutions, sites of uh, Bulgarian immigration in the country, Bulgarian presence in the country, a hotel run by a um, um, Bulgarian, where um, some gatherings of Bulgari uh, Bulgarians and also on cases of elections uh, take place take place in uh, this city. And uh, the other photo is of the uh, director of the Bulgarian uh, language school, which has a department in uh, um, uh, Cape Town uh, and uh, a really very serious, vibrant uh, uh, institution uh, for conveying native language to, uh, uh, well, it's not, not really native, but Bulgarian language to, uh, um, uh, children in Bulgarian or mixed uh, uh, families. Uh, another site, uh, which particularly in the 90s, but yet until today, is the, uh, which is uh, usually pointed out as a presence uh, and uh, staple mark of Bulgarian uh, um, community in Cape Town is uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, cheese farm uh, by a, a Bulgarian entrepreneur in um, uh, near uh, Cape Town, uh, Vasco Cheese uh, Firm, which uh, is usually very visited by almost any uh, visitor and uh, uh, from, uh, from Bulgaria or from any other part, uh, Bulgarian living in South Africa, visiting uh, Cape Town, various festive events or cele celebrations uh, um, uh, take place in uh, this uh, um, um, in this farm. Uh, also, uh, the, the, um, in terms of uh, uh, religious holidays or, or religious occasions of uh, um, uh, celebrations and uh, meeting together. Uh, although there is no church, uh, Bulgarian church in Cape Town, there is a, a, a Greek church which is identified as a place where Bulgarians usually meet. That's the Greek Orthodox uh, Church of St. George uh, in Cape Town, and that's a place where uh, one can really find uh, uh, co-nationals co uh, uh, as we actually did during 
during our trip. Um, and uh, another uh, place uh, which is uh, immediately propped out in conversations was this, uh, uh, the several cases of uh, pubs and uh, restaurants which are run, run by Bulgarians and are uh, meeting points of uh, co-nationals on various occasion, even, uh, occasions, sometimes even on a daily basis. Um, in terms of uh, Pretoria and Johannesburg, there is a much wider, um, a bit more extensive list of uh, institutional presence. And uh, as I pointed out, it started with the establishment in 93 of the Bulgarian uh, embassy uh, in Pretoria. Uh, also, uh, uh, after the establishment of the, the opening of the embassy, initiatives for creating uh, Bulgarian cultural sentence school, various uh, cases and examples over the years of establishing classes of Bulgarian language. And in um, 2007, there was uh, uh, founded the Bulgarian Cult Cultural Christian Center. That was the, uh, the way it was initially termed. After that, it was turned into a Bulgarian Cultural Center so that to uh, um, include uh, Bulgarians who are not uh, necessarily Christian, uh, by uh, religious affiliation. Um, and uh, with uh, regards to this association, uh, also there was, uh, in those years, there was established in 2009, um, uh, Bulgarian uh, language school, Bulgarian Sunday school called uh, Slancho, which Sunny is the translation, uh, and um, regular classes of Bulgarian language uh, every weekend, um, uh, mostly uh, Sundays, take place. Um, uh, since uh, the establishment of the school. Uh, in 2009, there was established uh, also the Bulgarian language church in South Africa. And although until today it does not have a, 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 a temple, um, a physical space where to, to gather in terms of a church building, uh, the uh, regular services um, uh, related to religious holidays, uh, uh, mostly on uh, Sundays, but not on some other days, uh, depending on the religious calendar take place. And in 2011, there was created the Associations, uh, Association of Bulgarians in South Africa, which put a really serious energy into the establishment of the Bulgarian Cultural Center in Midrand, which joined together and united several separate institutions uh, at one place at a property which was bought by the Bulgarian community and which uh, became a focal point for their meetings uh, uh, over weekends. So several uh, ill visual illustrations of this center, the building, uh, uh, the area around uh, um, the small chapel, which was adjusted uh, adjacent to the, uh, to the building for uh, religious purposes, the site within the property where the, um, how to say, the uh, grounds uh, for the future Bulgarian church temple uh, were uh, set uh, and uh, there was also laid uh, several years ago the first uh, 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 stone of the church uh, with uh, in a big ceremony with participation of uh, representatives for uh, from different communities uh, diplomats etc which also um, uh, testified with the very good relationships between uh, the Bulgarian community and other communities in uh, from uh, of immigrant communities from uh, Southeastern Europe and from Europe in general. Um, so just uh, illustrations from the interior of the, of the chapel um, and the uh, presence sent from Bulgaria of a, a, a priest uh, to serve uh, the religious uh, needs of the community. Um, and uh, also some uh, the the other major institution in the, the Bulgarian Cultural Center uh, the uh, Sunday school uh, Sloncho, which uh, has uh, nowadays uh, three different uh, uh, classes, uh, years of uh, education with separate uh, uh, library of uh, with Bulgarian uh, books in Bulgarian and uh, also in uh, in English with. Uh, um, uh, textbooks and uh, materials for educational purposes sent from Bulgaria with uh, details in the interior that would um, uh, address to uh, Bulgarian traditions. 
uh, as well as uh, um, uh, photos and uh, overall environment in the school for conveying messages in Bulgarian, uh, lessons in Bulgarian history, Bulgarian uh, historical figures, uh, Bulgarian um, holidays, uh, national uh, official holidays in the country. So just several illustrations, I'm not going in detail. And now uh, the school has also the uh, kindergarten with uh, not very big number of uh, kids, but still uh, youngsters who, who attend uh, on weekends with uh, uh, to, uh, they're uh, driven by their families to, to uh, uh, study or to have entertainment in the school. Uh, and it's important to point out that no matter that Midrand is in between uh, Pretoria and Johannesburg, just in the center. So uh, it was chosen for the purpose of being very convenient for both uh, towns uh, to, uh, to, to be at an equal distance and uh, easy reach, uh, but it also attracts uh, from really long distances families to, uh, to join the activities of the center. Uh, some illustrations related as we documented uh, during our field work, some rehearsals and um, uh, concerts for uh, the forthcoming uh, last year Mar uh, national holiday on the 3rd of March. Um, and uh, the very the active participation of the, uh, of the teachers. And here that's the uh, LAPA, the uh, really very big hut uh, or uh, premise um, or uh, tent. The uh, local uh, lo adjusted in a local or constructed in a locally specific way, which uh, uh, is used for social gatherings uh, in the within the property of the Bulgarian Cultural Center. Some activities you see informal uh, aspects of uh, chatting, gathering together, uh, entering into conversations, having food together. Uh, uh, and uh, also in this particular case, that was the uh, we were uh, our visit was uh, related to the in the beginning of March. So that was the occasion of celebration of the first of March, which also for our Romanian colleagues uh, is uh, recognizable for the uh, uh, shared cultural tradition of Martishor, uh, uh, and in Bulgarian case it's called Martinica. So that was the case of preparation of uh, um, this uh, uh, specific symbol of the uh, uh, arrival of, uh, of spring. Um, and you see with participation of children and parents, uh, uh, and also that's the, it's an opportunity of uh, uh, having rehearsals uh, during uh, uh, Sunday, uh, on Sundays and Saturdays sometimes uh, of this, uh, the local uh, fol folklore group, Bulgarian folklore dance group, uh, um, Bulgarian Rose, which uh, involves mem active members, mostly active members of the uh, Bulgarian Cultural Center who rehearse during the uh, during uh, uh, weekends and sometimes are invited and have uh, participation in uh, local events, uh, concerts, uh, uh, festive activities. Uh, uh, also, they are also invited by uh, some other immigrant communities. We heard stories about uh, uh, festive celebrations of uh, Serbs and uh, Greeks, etc. So that's uh, uh, an illustration of their uh, work. And also in terms of this uh, um, very uh, uh, strongly present in the conversations, in the um, interactions uh, with uh, Bulgarians living in South Africa, the presence of local uh, Bulgarian traditions in terms of food, drinks, and all these uh, um, tastes that are maintained in a way that would resemble and would remind them of, uh, uh, of Bulgaria. Uh, the, in the cultural center, there is also a, a Bulgarian uh, restaurant uh, or a, a place where they bring food, uh, home-made uh, food, uh, following traditional Bulgarian recipes, and they consume them during the, their uh, uh, social gatherings. And uh, you see all these emblems and um, reminders uh, uh, speaking by themselves uh, to, to the, the community of uh, the country uh, of uh, origin, or at least the country of origin of the first generation. Just briefly in terms of conclusion, uh, 
uh, several points that I would like really to to raise up with regards to this uh, um, this fieldwork and the um, uh, case we are encountering with this uh, immigrant community. It's the specific the first uh, the, the first place the specific meaning of uh, immigrant community. Uh, can we speak and we we keep on encountering this. Uh, uh, issue. Can we speak about an immigrant community when we have really a case of uh, uh, co-nationals in this case, but some of them are really do not know each other well. There, there is no information even about them, statistics, etc. Uh, they're scattered at long distances, maintaining quite irregular contacts in between in most of the cases, probably with the exception of this Bulgarian cultural center where interaction is very intense. Um, so they're very well adjusted to the local environment, but at the same time, they maintain cultural identity links with the country of origin and try to keep it up on at some point, uh, in some way, even on, uh, on a daily basis. The second point is related to the specific dimensions of immigrant institutions. So they are predominantly grassroots, with the exception of the embassy. The other uh, institutions, they are locally based, they are created by immigrants themselves, uh, and they follow strategies of consolidation, institutionalization of uh, in immigrants in, into the um, country. Of, um, um, of residence, South Africa in this case. And the last point is also related to the specific dimension of cultural heritage and immigration. So this is heritage that was brought from the uh, um, from the immigrants to, within a new environment, maintained in a specific way, a calendar of uh, is following in a, uh, how to say, interim way between the uh, official calendar of the uh, holidays in South Africa, but also some following and observance of holidays in, in Bulgaria. So there is a mixture blend, but at the same time, it's uh, some cultural references, some specific space and a set of practices that seek to relate to the home country. They're important in, uh, for not for all, certainly. I don't want to emphasize that, not for all, but for some of the immigrants as a way to maintain cultural identity, which is different from the surrounding context. Uh, and it links them to a distant country, one that was, um, uh, that is already very remote, not only geographically, but it, it is also remote in terms of biographical past experience for the first generation. And it is even more remote, remote for the representatives of the second and third generation. So quite a challenge for um, uh, to answer such questions, but uh, I pose them not with the idea of answering, giving an answer, but just as a point of reflection. Once again, thanks for the opportunity to share these thoughts and thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Nikolai. It's been uh, really nice to see, uh, especially uh, the, uh, how the spaces look and um, also how the community is getting together and different activities that they are doing. I can also say that all institutions were established just a little bit earlier than the Ukrainian institutions of um, uh, Ukrainians in um, uh, South Africa. So it also was interesting to, from that point of view to see how the institutional development um, uh, happened um, in the of Bulgarian community in South Africa. Uh, do we have uh, any um, immediate questions? I think, Nicola, you can stop. Uh, yes, I, I, I will just do it in a, in a while. I've tried to manage with the... Uh, uh, sorry, it I'll, takes some I'll, time uh, yeah, to, to get back to, to the screen. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I will continue this um, uh, conversation about the Eastern European uh, communities uh, in uh, South Africa uh, by uh, presenting experience of um, uh, Ukrainians um, in the, uh, South Africa. And I myself uh, am a migrant and I'm not really a researcher of uh, specifically um, uh, Ukrainian, uh, uh, specifically of uh, migration. Uh, but uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Ukrainian Association and currently 
uh, a president of um, Ukrainian Association. So that's uh, my perspective uh, for this uh, presentation. Um, So I wanted to show, especially for those who are joining us from uh, South Africa, uh, a little uh, geographical connection that we have between Ukraine and South Africa, because uh, maybe not many uh, know that um, there is Mazepa Bay, a geographical point on the wild coast that is named after Ukrainian um, uh, hetman, Ukrainian leader uh, of um, uh, 17th, 18th century, Ivan uh, Mazepa. And Mazepa Bay is uh, famous for uh, fishing and uh, beautiful sunsets. Uh, there is also a street, uh, Mazepa, in uh, Durban. And the connection uh, to Ukrainian uh, hetman is quite vague uh, because uh, Ivan Mazepa obviously have never traveled himself to uh, South Africa, but his uh, image has traveled widely in literature. He became one of the representatives of the Romanticism uh, period. And um, uh, famous uh, authors, um, Voltaire and uh, Byron, um, uh, Hugo, uh, dedicated um, the literature pieces to Ivan Mazepa, where his personality was uh, shown as a person that uh, fights for freedom, fights for its um, nation, and um, um, also a person that lives uh, to the uh, uh, bright life. So creates lots of um, amazing experiences in the, his um, uh, life. Uh, so that um, image and especially a poem uh, written by uh, Byron uh, caused the tendency where different uh, boats would be named uh, by the name Mazepa, including uh, Byron's own yacht that had uh, the name uh, Mazepa. However, the uh, name of uh, South African Mazepa uh, Bay comes from um, a schooner that was built um, um, a little bit uh, later in the uh, 18th century and uh, was uh, traveling between America and uh, South Africa and later on the Southern African coast. So it used to stop often in that uh, bay and that's how the bay uh, developed this name, Mazepa Bay, after the Shuna that was also uh, prominent in the Anglo-Boer War. And that's probably how the name uh, Mazepa uh, came uh, to uh, Durban. So this is uh, just one of the examples, and uh, I'm grateful for all the research done around Mazepa Bay to the professor from Kozulu Natal, to Tony Voss, who uh, published five um, uh, articles um, about uh, um, the representation of Mazepa in uh, South African lit literature, uh, as uh, Roy Campbell also dedicated uh, his um, uh, poem to Mazepa and to this topic, uh, also transforming um, uh, it in his own uh, way. Um, so some other key moments of migration from the territory of Ukraine, uh, one is uh, that was uh, uh, mentioned before, uh, the Jewish community from Ukrainian territory in 1880s, 1911, the estimated number of migrants from, that, from Ukrainian territory, uh, which at the time was um, a part of um, uh, Russia, is about 15,000 uh, uh, migrants, uh, but obviously it's, uh, it's an uh, estimation. Um, but uh, based on the um, uh, statistics um, from um, um, uh, census at that time. Uh, Ukrainians during the uh, Anglo-Boer War, there is a bright example of uh, Yuri Budyak, uh, whose um, uh, real name was uh, uh, Pokos, uh, Yuri Pokos, and the story goes, which is not proven by the uh, documents, but uh, by his own accounts, that uh, during the time of his participation in Anglo-Boer War, uh, he uh, was the person that released Winston Churchill. Uh, uh, so and the connection between the two of them uh, remained, and uh, uh, Yuri Budyak visited uh, UK and visited Churchill in the, in the UK. Um, later events uh, that happened uh, in Ukraine during the World, World War I and World War II caused other incidents of uh, migration, uh, also very little uh, researched. 
Uh, we can uh, mention Xenia Palmas, a famous uh, singer who uh, moved after First World War first to Europe and then to uh, South Africa. Also, Boris Polinsky, um, the researcher, uh, one of uh, those uh, academics who established um, embryology in um, uh, South Africa, especially electronic embryology, who worked um, uh, half of his life in the uh, Kyiv um, uh, Research Institute and the other half at the uh, Wits University, um, Boris uh, Balinsky. Um, so those are uh, just examples of those Ukrainians uh, who represent different uh, periods, but um, uh, the research is not ex exclusive. So we haven't uh, really uh, gone through all the uh, documents. Another uh, interesting case is of Bohdan Stashinsky, who was um, a KGB um, assassinator, who assassinated uh, two leaders of Ukrainian emigre movement in uh, Germany and in France, um, Lev Rebets, Rebet and um, uh, Stepan Bandera, who are uh, prominent uh, Ukrainians. Uh, uh, after uh, later in his life, he uh, um, uh, submitted himself to CIA and then uh, moved to uh, South Africa and where he was given a different uh, name and uh, continued to trade uh, South African uh, spies. And on a more positive note, um, here is a photo of uh, Rita and uh, Cindy Sompaniana who um, uh, met in, while during uh, Sindiso's uh, studies at the Kiev Economic um, University. Uh, and uh, then um, they both moved first to Zambia and then to South Africa after independence and played an important role uh, in the ANC uh, movements. So those are uh, examples of Ukrainians that moved to South Africa in different periods prior to 1992, uh, when Ukraine, uh, Ukraine became uh, independent and the diplomatic relationship between the two countries was established. This is um, one of the examples of people to people cooperation. The Ukrainian Institute, uh, Museum, um, Museum of Ukrainian Culture in Riversdale, that was uh, established with the effort of uh, Chris Todd. Chris uh, was um, uh, mayor of uh, uh, Hesekwa of Riversdale. And um, uh, one of the conferences, uh, he uh, met uh, the mayor of Voznesensk. Um, uh, in the Ukraine and they've established cooperation. So this people-to-people -people, uh, collaboration uh, lasted till nowadays. Every year, apart from last year, uh, groups from uh, Ukraine come to visit uh, South Africa and uh, South Africa, um, so South African uh, visit Ukraine. So during uh, those uh, almost 20 years of cooperation, over 200 uh, South Africans have uh, visited uh, Ukraine and uh, vice versa. You can see murals that are done in uh, uh, Riversdale. Uh, one is uh, done uh, jointly by South African uh, and uh, Ukrainian uh, children, uh, the mural of uh, kids. And uh, there are the landscape uh, also moves between Ukraine and South Africa. The other mural is done by uh, local Riversdale uh, artist who was very impressed. Uh, by the beauty of uh, Ukrainian Crimea when they visited um, uh, prior to annexation and uh, have uh, uh, drawn this uh, mural in the, uh, in the museum. There are other institutions uh, that uh, were developed um, uh, later. Just move to the next slide. Uh, there are other institutions um, uh, Ukrainian diaspora in the, uh, South Africa, Ukrainian school were established uh, after Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, as that was one of the important factors for Ukrainian uh, community to establish its own institutions. So for example, uh, Ukrainian diaspora in South Africa uh, was established to uh, support humanitarian um, uh, projects. Uh, during the time of an active stage um, of uh, war 
and um, obviously uh, later uh, institute because Ukrainians got together other institutions have developed at the same time as you probably have seen that the slide that Oksana showed a number of Ukrainians has increased since 2010 um, and uh, that as a factor that affected that Ukrainian institutions were formed as Ukrainian community prior at, at the beginning of 1992 was very uh, small we are talking about 1000 of Ukrainians uh, in the in the whole South Africa and uh, in by 2010 we um, uh, we've seen around three to four thousand of Ukrainians so the number of Ukrainians is growing and that's why the institutions uh, were formed a Ukrainian school in South Africa was uh, in Cape Town was uh, established in March uh, 2016 and um, uh, later branches in Pretoria and Durban uh, were also established in the um, uh, 2016, also the initiative of Ukrainian Days in South Africa started and the first Ukrainian festival took place in March 2017, where Ukrainians really wanted to show Ukrainian culture to um, their families, to their friends who had no opportunity to come to Ukraine. And as part of those uh, Ukrainian Days, books were uh, presented at different uh, libraries and uh, the movies were shown. So based from that initiative of Ukrainian Days and Ukrainian Festival, uh, the uh, Ukrainian nonprofit organization was uh, registered Ukrainian Association of South Africa. So Ukrainian diaspora was um, a registration with three members and it's a basic um, registration of nonprofit com company, but Ukrainian Association allows for everyone, any Ukrainian or South African uh, to join the organization. Um, Currently, there is Ukrainian library where uh, books about Ukraine in English and also uh, Ukrainian books uh, are available for those who are interested. And um, uh, from uh, the initiation of um, Ukrainian Association, there was also uh, one of the representatives traveled to the meeting of um, uh, diaspora members uh, in uh, Kiev and uh, was uh, nominated as uh, Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce in South Africa representative. Uh, also in the 2020, the Ukrainian language classes uh, for adults started. So those are different institutions that um, help to uh, establish cooperation between the um, Ukraine and um, uh, South Africa and also to preserve um, Ukrainian culture um, in South Africa. Here are the objectives of Ukrainian Association. And if you uh, look at them, they're a little bit wider than um, just looking at the community interest. Uh, so association looks at uniting Ukrainians in South Africa, but also to develop networks um, of uh, South African interested in Ukraine, uh, promote Ukrainian culture to South African and uh, to promote cooperation between South African and Ukrainian institutions. Then um, other important uh, part is uh, to uh, promote the territorial integrity uh, because of the situation that uh, Ukraine is at uh, now. And um, here are some examples of uh, those uh, projects that were implemented. Uh, the Ukrainian festival is an annual event uh, that uh, is happening uh, in the Western Cape. International Public Art Festival, Ukrainian artist has been um, participating uh, between 2017 and 2019, and you can see uh, a 150 square meter mural uh, in the middle of Cape Town that was drawn by Tatiana uh, Hearn and uh, Alexander Nikitiuk as a part of that uh, festival. Um, Ukrainian poets were participating in Poetry Africa festivals 2017-2018 and um, uh, on the later stages the embassy took over that initiative similar with the uh, public art festival um, while the, the cooperation was initiated by uh, Ukrainian association it was um, uh, later uh, transferred to the embassy. Uh, also in the June uh, 2021 we will um, uh, we are expecting the dance performance uh, forest to happen and uh, for those who are in Pretoria, you know, I'm welcoming you to, uh, to join the performance. 
presentation of um, Ukrainian literature in South Africa and the uh, libraries. Um, and they also mentioned the examples of uh, integrity of uh, Ukraine. Uh, so there's a presentation on Holodomor, and that's a man-made genocide that happened in Ukraine 1932-1933, and Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Association initiated a petition uh, that the, the, uh, the Holodomor is recognized as a genocide by South African parliament. Um, the presentation on the uh, Russian aggression in um, Ukraine at South African Institute of International Affairs, uh, also uh, um, projects linked to Ukrainian veterans of um, um, a Russian-Ukrainian war uh, who came to uh, South Africa and um, uh, presented the project uh, Victors uh, in partnership with uh, Artscape Theatre. And it's not just about the veterans, it's also about uh, those people uh, who uh, became uh, 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 who lost their uh, limbs but uh, didn't uh, lose their, um, their uh, spirit and can inspire other, other uh, people who are going through hardships. Also economic cooperation that is supported by Ukrainian Association uh, like presentation at the Chamber of um, uh, Commerce in 2018 and the uh, building community and supporting cooperation between uh, entrepreneurs in um, Ukraine and uh, South Africa. In the last year, uh, Ukrainian Association together with uh, IECDR, um, a research institute on diaspora in the Ukraine, done the research that Oksana has been uh, presenting. Uh, also, uh, we actively uh, communicate with the embassy of Ukraine in South Africa and the Embassy of South Africa in Ukraine, as well as with um, members of parliaments in um, South Africa. Uh, thanks a lot. And um, I would uh, like to uh, show a little um, uh, video uh, of, so that you can get a taste of uh, what it, uh, uh, what it um, looks like. This is Ukrainian festival in 2018. And this specific festival was attended by 6,000 people.
Thanks for, a lot for uh, your attention, um, and I'll be happy to answer any uh, questions um, uh, later. And I'll pass uh, now the word to uh, Istvan Tarosi from the um, University of uh, PEC in um, Hungary, and uh, Istvan is um, also an expert on the Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Eastern European countries' uh, cooperation, but uh, he will ask him to focus uh, as much as possible on Hungarian community as well, because we know that the community has a, a long uh, history in South Africa and is quite active. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, greetings to all of you. I'm really delighted to be here with you today and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Zvinka. And a special thanks should go to my good friend, uh, Stefan uh, Chibian, actually, uh, uh, to set up this connection between the two of us and uh, get this invitation uh, going. Uh, so thank you. Um, a bit just to add uh, briefly to my um, fields of study and research, um, I hold a PhD in political science and teach as professor at the University of Pech in the southern part of Hungary. Um, where I also direct the uh, country's Africa Research Center um, for over 10 years now. Um, from September on, I will be also uh, the director of a new PhD program, which will have a focus, special focus on uh, Africa and, and Sub-Saharan Africa especially. That's a doctoral program in uh, international politics. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my research uh, fields and interests actually um, include um, well, the international relations of sub-Saharan African countries uh, with a focus on um, the foreign policies of uh, Central and Eastern European countries, especially the Visegrad Four um, uh, towards sub-Saharan Africa, but also focusing on diaspora related issues. Uh, but I'm interested rather in the neglected, as I call them, African diaspora living in uh, Central and Eastern European countries. However, uh, I I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, today, I would, would like to focus on uh, obviously the Hungarian community living in South Africa and to look into this community and the history, the development and the activities of this community in light of um, uh, a growingly, um, uh, you know, expanding kind of foreign policy horizon between the two countries and especially um, in, in light of the new foreign policy chapters of the country um, of Hungary. So uh, obviously I, I should put you first of all into a more uh, a broader diasporic kind of context of Hungarians very briefly, but I think that's important. And what we can say is that there are two major groups of the Hungarian diaspora living all around the world. Uh, the autochthonous uh, to the motherland, of course, live outside of Hungary. And that's very much connected to the peace treaty of uh, Paris, uh, the Trian Trianon treaty especially. Um, but well, in a number of cases you can read uh, in, in the literature pieces that they are not counted as diaspora. Okay, then the immigrants, of course, who left Hungary um, in, in uh, certain uh, circumstances, historical circumstances, a number of historical events push these people out of their homelands uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, push them into immigration, basically, with an E here. Um, you can go back to mid 19th century and the Hungarian revolution against the Habsburgs over there. Uh, of course, all of us know about the 1956 revolution that was uh, very bloodily crushed by the Soviets. Um, then, of course, the political changes and regime changes all across the macro region at the end of the 1980s. And since the uh, full membership uh, to the EU of Hungary uh, 2004, but, you know, since the early 2000s, I would, I would say, and I will reflect upon some of these historical events. Uh, the autochthonous uh, Hungarians uh, in the Carpathian Basin, um, you can detect uh, all across these uh, countries, of course, just to just to make sure that you are aware of, you know, all the Hungarians living outside of the country. And this is away from this very macro region, uh, the most of um, the immigrant communities, basically, of Hungarians uh, in Northern Africa, uh, North, Northern America, uh, and, and all around, basically, uh, Latin America, as well as Europe. Um, and you will see uh, to, to what extent, to how uh, large extent, actually, we, we consider the Hungarian diaspora important uh, in South Africa. Um, it, it is also interesting to deal with and put everything I'm going to talk about into an, another important uh, context, and that is diaspora politics, the diaspora politics of the Hungarian government in light of you know, current trends in the, in the past two decades or so in immigration 
So outbound migration tendencies, you can see, you know, the curve again, an upward curve actually in the past couple of years. And at the same time, as a kind of a parallel process to that, which then will shed light on the diaspora politics of the government, there is a, there is a declining tendency in demographic terms within the realms of the Hungarian state. Uh, as you can see, again, in the past two decades, an aging and declining population. And one of the solutions, according to the uh, government, is as, as uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary said that to the so-called diaspora council, that only Hungarians can replace Hungarians. And, uh, and it's a very focused policy uh, angle, therefore, on dealing with the di diaspora. Here, a diaspora council is res responsible for that. Within the government, there's a, there's a heavy emphasis on you know, diaspora policy. And, and there is yet uh, a, another new kind of uh, research think tank, the, the, the Research Institute for National Strategy, um, um, which of course supports um, with all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of evidence and data, you know, this kind of um, government policy. Um, a, very, a very new tool uh, that was introduced by the government is a scholarship called the Diaspora Scholarship which reaches out basically, as you can read here, reaches out to you know, uh, communities all around the world uh, with Hungarian identity and offer them the opportunity to come back to the motherland and study at you know, universities all across Hungary. I will come back to that as well in a second. So let's look into the Hungarians in South Africa, which uh, very similarly to some of the countries we have heard, very interesting presentations, by the way, uh, dear colleagues. Um, I, I really learned a lot so far. So, you know, different waves. Uh, you can see, you go back in you know, the 19th century, and you can see the first settlers basically coming in. Uh, most of them that time involved in the gold rush, the third gold rush. And there's a, there's a, there's a guy called Alois Hugo Nelmapius, um, who is quite an interesting figure, um, you know, in this particular sense. Um, and, and, well, he's supposed to, to have found one of the um, big, you know, gold nuggets of the time. It's the, the four tracker nugget actually discovered in 1875. Um, but of course, there are other waves uh, after the First World War, especially after the Trianon Treaty. And those arriving after this uh, started to organize themselves into kind of a community. Um, a couple of years uh, later, um, and that was the first kind of um, official date, 1932, uh, the so-called Hungarian Alliance of South Africa was established. Uh, then we have mentioned already the 1956 revolution, after which uh, a quota of 1,300 refugees was set by South Africa then. And uh, you know those refugees uh, were allowed to, to, to come to South Africa and settle there and fi find a new life, basically. After that, a couple of years later, uh, for a couple of years, basically, another around 3,000 people arrived uh, uh, in South Africa. And then we can look at the, the contemporary times uh, in, the, in the new millennium and the new century, uh, basically from the early 2000s on. Um, as kind of posted workers working for multinational companies or working for international organizations connected with uh, development issues, especially. So the, 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 the really highly skilled, um, um, you know, Hungarians or of Hungarian identity and origin arrived. Uh, I, I have been fostering a, a kind of a series of interviews with um, some of them. And one of my respondents who is a really well-known medical doctor actually arrived in 2002. And, and actually he was working for UNDP for several years. Um, so that's, that's one of the examples basically. Uh, today, what we can say is that there's an estimated 4,000 Hungarians or of Hungarian descent or origin actually living in the Republic of South Africa. A community, um, what kind of activities of this uh, community as a community basically um, there's a, the so-called Hungarian farm that was established. This is the Magyar Tanya, uh, established in uh, the 1970s, uh, prior to which there were two clubs of these Hungarian uh, communities. One, a kind of a more elite-like club uh, for the more well-off, and there was another one for the poorer people. Um, this particular Magyar Tanya is located between Joburg and, and Pretoria, and it's really an important venue and location and meeting point actually in terms of activities 
of the Hungarian communities living in South Africa. The alliance itself has been really active. The Hungarian Alliance of South Africa uh, and, and reaffirmed with a new mission actually in 1957, re-established basically, reaffirmed, as you can see, focusing on Hungarian language and especially focusing on the upcoming generations uh, in terms of keeping tradition as well as the language and culture. Um, of, of course, very similarly to what uh, Stefan uh, mentioned about the Polish kind of um, uh, you know, activities, very similarly to that, commemorate important events uh, connected with, uh, of course, uh, you know, Hungarian history, uh, culinary delights, of course, traditions and events, uh, uh, focusing on cuisine, obviously, and to build a strong Hungarian community in South Africa, very important uh, kind of um, mission of, of this. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, the, 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 the venues such as, of course, this estate uh, would be uh, certainly uh, highly important. Uh, if you, you know, look back in time and look into the present day situation, there are a couple of, you know, cases that we may come up with as, well, we may say, potentially important Hungarian footprints in, in uh, South Africa. Uh, one is connected to this, um, well, rather debated personality, um, Nel Mapius, uh, who was trained as an engineer and then was very, mu very much successful in the gold mining, uh, established also one of the first uh, Hungary-related kind of estates, the Irene estate near Pretoria. Uh, and he was, you know, among others, he started to, to deal with gunpowder, uh, you know, production. Uh, he was basically the first, um, you know, kind of uh, entrepreneur in that. Uh, here you can see a book, The Tycoon and the President, that's the life and the times of Nel Mapius by, by, by Helga Kay, a very interesting volume actually. Um, we can also come up with uh, Desiderius or Dejo Pongratz, uh, a 56, 56er, an immigrant basically of the time, uh, who launched a, a very important wine and champagne business. And over there you can see the Pongratz champagne, uh, which is quite something of course across uh, the region. Or we, we can think about yet another Hungarian related kind of uh, little spot, um, well, near Cape Town, and that's uh, the Tokai Manor and the Arboretum as well, uh, very much connected back to the late uh, 18th uh, century, um, uh, you know, incoming uh, Hungarian soldiers. And uh, the, the name itself resembles a very important region in the northern, northern upper part uh, uh, of the country in Hungary. Uh, that's the Tokai uh, with a J at the end of, of the, uh, the name, uh, wine growing area. So here, of course, they established a, a vineyard uh, resembling that kind, of, um, that kind of feeling, basically. Um, and if we place all these into, into a present day foreign policy context, it will, you know, all these as, as, as kind of background and connecting threads basically make, make potentially even more sense. As of today, Hungary, um, you know, revisited uh, its uh, foreign policy all across the, the region of Central and Eastern Europe. We saw that around the change of the political systems at the end of the 1980s, uh, basically most of the countries really focused on very fast forward kind of integration into the, you know, you know Western, Western dominated structures, let it be NATO, let it be the European Union. Um, and, 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 and it seemed that they, well, somehow forgot about, uh, but definitely did not prioritize the formerly important relations connected with the African continent. That, that was the case in Hungary. Uh, many ties were cut back or um, you know, frozen as a matter of fact. Uh, but as of today, we have a kind of a, a renewed interest, a kind of a re-engaging attitude all across Central and Eastern Europe in Hungary as well, which results in uh, 11 embassies as of, as of today, all around, as you can see, the continent, and six in sub-Saharan Africa, one of them uh, being a focal point, of course, in, in Pretoria. There is a, a new foreign policy chapter called Southern Opening uh, Policy uh, that was, um, you know, um, put forward by the government in uh, 2015. And uh, the focus is very similar to what my good friend uh, Stefan Cibian talked about in, in terms of Romania, uh, you know, economic diplomacy, export-oriented trade diplomacy, uh, international development, of 
course, uh, uh, there's a government agency called Hungary Helps, you know, fostering all sorts of projects and, and education research. And I'm really interested in the next, the last speaker actually talking about, you know, academic connections and, and, uh, and exchanges uh, between Romania and South Africa later on. So, you know, very similar focus of all these countries of our macro region. Um, also, I um, collected a number of additional diplomatic kind of tools, such as the honorary consuls and the honorary consular network. Uh, of the four Visegrad countries. And here you can see that Hungary has two such kind of consulates and, and, and it's additionally honorary consular kind of activities, one in Cape Town and one in Durban. In terms of contemporary relations, if we look back, you know, uh, the past kind of uh, 20, 30 years and 30 will be the magic number uh, since, uh, you know, we have been celebrating in 2021, the 30th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the two countries. So here, basically the first two decades was really interesting, right after basically the, uh, you know, change of the political systems, uh, because, you know, there was a heavy focus on trade. Uh, we heard from Stefan Cibian also, you know, how that was in the case of Romania, very similar basically. Um, and, 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 you know, South Africa came uh, as as one of the top, you know, Hungarian uh, export destinations outside Europe, and also we saw from an investment perspective that South Africans uh, started to invest in the region. For instance, also in our beer industry, but all across Central and Eastern Europe. Saab Miller was there. Um, well, a couple of years ago, of course, we may know all of us uh, that uh, uh, Asahi took over basically that portfolio. Anyway, um, in 2011, connected to the new opening kind of um, uh, approach of the Hungarian government, uh, a new position was also um, introduced at the embassy in Pretoria, a commercial counselor focusing even further more on commercial linkages. And, and therefore the establishment, the creation of the South Africa-Hungary Joint Economic Commission in 2013 meant an important step forward in that sense to further diversify relations. Um, the brand new, the brand new uh, policy chapter is the so-called Southern Opening, as I told you. And part of that, there is a heavy focus now on education and how higher education especially, exchanges, research projects, and so on. And there's an annual quota of government scholarships uh, given to 100 South African young people to come to Hungarian university and study. So there is, there is, there is a, a wide variety of now opening uh, opportunities in which uh, the Hungarian community and especially the Hungarian businessmen actually uh, in South Africa can play an even larger role just finishing off with this focus, particularly given to education, uh, which then can connect, uh, of course, us to the next uh, topic as well. Uh, if you check, you know, what study fields are promoted uh, by the government of Hungary uh, in terms of inviting, you know, young South Africans to come and study, you can here see all the three levels, bachelor, master and doctoral studies, and, and you know, a, a wide portfolio again, uh, just as a case study, my university, which is one of the forerunners in inter internationalization in the country, uh, we have out of the 20,000 students we have at, at present, uh, well over 4,500 students from well over 110 countries, uh, including 400 African students from all across the African continent, out of which due to the scholarship program, we have 33 uh, students at present uh, from the Republic of South Africa. They study biology, geography, computer science, physics, as you can see, engineering, and international relations, for instance, human resources, counseling, and, and others. There was a special year in 2010, which connects my city to South Africa even more. Of course, we know about the Soccer World Cup, uh, which was running then, but First time ever uh, in a Hungarian, uh, you know, cultural kind of historical perspective, a city got a very important title from the European Union, and that was the European Capital of Culture title. Pech, my city, became the European Capital of Culture, and that was the year when, together with the uh, ambassador of South Africa to Hungary, uh, we together launched a biannual international conference series in Pech. That's the Pech African Studies Conference. Ever since we have been organizing that. Uh, so, you know, that kind of a, a, a unique, uh, peculiar connection. And we had a fantastic launch conference, basically, with fantastic keynote speakers that time. 
And this is the very final uh, bit um, when uh, uh, the, the uh, Hungarian ambassador presented uh, his letter of credence to the president of, of South Africa in April. And here that the focus was on the 30 years of diplomatic relations between the two countries. And here you can see as of course, I mean, a very important uh, official diplomatic uh, stance on it, you know, an excellent kind of opportunity to go further down the road in terms of higher education, collaboration, science and technology, and especially recently water resource management. But I think there are much more to that, uh, especially when we look into the Hungarian community in South Africa. Thank you very much for your cooperation and attention. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Istvan. Uh, it's uh, indeed uh, uh, there are lots of similarities, but also each community has uh, a lot of unique, unique um, uh, examples and unique situations. And uh, I myself learned that Tokai comes from uh, Hungary, and uh, I'm staying uh, very close to Tokai area in uh, Cape Town. So I've uh, also learned a lot uh, from your presentation. And then um, uh, Silvio, uh, if we can uh, uh, maybe. Uh, 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 move to you, and um, we will do, be doing uh, one more of those um, uh, interactive engagements uh, via uh, menti.com. Um, so maybe while uh, we are also listening to the uh, presentation, uh, I'll share a, uh, a link in the chat uh, with uh, one more uh, question uh, that is um, um, around uh, research areas that you think would be interesting uh, to collaborate on or to uh, continue uh, investigating between the uh, Eastern European communities and um, um, uh, so South Africa. Thank you very much, Zvinka. Uh, uh, thank you, Stefan, as well, for putting us together. Stefan Chibian, he's, he's the masterminding manipulator from behind the scenes. It's funny that I've heard you saying the same thing. But yes, uh, it is a great honor and pleasure to, to be with you here. And I just please want to accept my, uh, to, to ask for, for, for apologies for, for uh, looking rather arrogant and just coming more or less for my own speech. Uh, it is actually, uh, I, I, I've, had, I've been through a very, very busy day on, on uh, engagements that I could not escape other than by saying that I have to come to this meeting. So thank you for providing me this, uh, this opportunity for, for a fresh uh, breath of fresh air uh, after a full day of, of um, business meetings from Brussels and, and, and Bucharest. So, yeah, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to, to greet here Ambassador Beck at Bali. We, we, we met years ago uh, when, when I, was, I served as a diplomat in Cape Town uh, uh, and uh, yes, I, I, I'm surrounded by, by Cape Town pictures around my, my desk here. Uh, Cape Town is in my heart, South Africa is in my heart. Um, I don't know what, what Stefan has said about the Romanian community here and everything I, I can agree it's true. I can, I can say yes, it's true, whatever he said, but uh, uh, I wish I would have, I was, I, I was in, in, the, in, the, in the meeting then, but I couldn't make it. Um, yes, I served as a consul general for Romania for seven years in Cape Town, uh, which, which was a very enlightening experience in regard to Southern Africa. Uh, but more than that, obviously, it offered me fantastic opportunities to, to connect with the South African world, with the Southern African world. And uh, that connection lasted. And I, I, I when I returned back to, to Romania in 20, I think it was 2013, 14, uh, I didn't want to lose touch with, with uh, that part of the world and we continued our, our engagements. I'm an academic, I teach at the West University of Timisoara. Uh, I'm a professor here. Um, I come from a background in, in moral philosophy applied to political science, to social sciences. Uh, and I deal a lot with human rights, foundations of human rights. So that was also an amazing opportunity for me to, to be in South Africa, in Cape Town, where some of the best, uh, best uh, scholars dealing with, with uh, uh, human rights uh, are based. Uh, obviously, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I, I managed to know intimately, people working for, for that commission, and then the people running various centers of research. Uh, so I stayed in touch with, with South Africa. Upon my return, I, I established a uh, Center for African Studies at my university, and I greet Diana Stoika, my, my doctoral student here. Uh, 
it is it is a center that was built somehow not directly out of my uh, of my I mean my my interest is not directly focused on on southern African uh, issues but I thought okay this is an experience we should not lose and that's why we we have the center there we have a few events going on there but certainly I encourage uh, research on the region um, but again this is not my main priority Diana is one of the very few students who did who, who, who embarked on embarked on uh, on studying uh, uh, African issues and uh, I look for the day when she'll pick over take take over this this center at some stage somehow but uh, in terms of my connection with my academic connection uh, from my experience I would like to to point you to uh, this I think this is what we discussed with Zvinka at some stage that I'll give you some of my my experience so that you can <coughs> think about possibilities of further connections between between uh, the academic world of South Africa and countries in, in Europe, particularly Central Eastern Europe, but also other countries in Europe. Um, first of all, at the national level, I don't know if Stefan Chibian has mentioned this, the Romanian government also offers a variety of uh, possibilities for studies for Southern African uh, people. It starts with uh, diaspora, with the Romanian diaspora as well. We have a program that uh, we offer scholarships to uh, Romanian students, students of Romanian origins who live abroad, and obviously South Africans, Romanians are qualified for that. We also offer um, a number of scholarships uh, fully covered by the Romanian government through the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, it's called the Eugenio Nesco scholarships for people from, from abroad and South Africans are fully qualified. And part of our rota in, in the EU engagement with Southern Africa, it's also to offer uh, scholarships so around, I, I remember when I was a consul general, we would have about 40, 50, 60 scholarships every year from Southern African, uh, South Africa, but Southern African students as well, uh, fully covered by the Romanian government. Uh, that's at the national level, but then more than the national level, I think at the, at the European level, I think uh, one of the best ways from my own experience to, to tap into, into finances for connecting uh, academics in South Africa with, uh, with Romania and any other country, particularly from the European Union, uh, is through Erasmus uh, projects, various forms of Erasmus, Erasmus Plus projects. Uh, in the last already almost a decade, uh, Erasmus Plus projects became very accessible. So you, all you need is to have a EU member state university partner with your universities in Southern, in Southern Africa, South Africa, Southern Africa, any country. And then uh, they can apply the EU, the EU um, uh, university or academic settings, uh, uh, setting will apply for a scholarship and for, for various forms of, of uh, uh, connections between the two institutions. So you don't need to have those large networks. Earlier on, it, you'd have to have three different EU universities plus to be able to invite a Southern African or South African university. Today, it's bilateral, purely bilateral. If Petch University and the Stellenbosch University wants to connect, if they find the real connections, the real interest, they can connect. So I did build such a, such a scheme and it works. Uh, our project, we wrote, uh, I wrote it with colleagues of mine from Stellenbosch University and from, from Cape Town University, from Western Cape University. Uh, we, we wrote an, uh, an application for a, uh, which is uh, refunded every year. Uh, uh, it's something on uh, training uh, students at PhD level, uh, creating opportunities for students to, to study uh, at PhD level in exchange programs uh, between our university. And as I said, we have two contracts, one with Stellenbosch and one with Western Cape University every year. Uh, one or two PhD students from each side of the of the bridge will visit the other side. Uh, scholarships are covered for three to six months. And uh, again, each year, one at least or maybe two faculty members and administrative members of the members of the administration of the universities are exchanging places, but only for for one week um, each uh, that is restricted to just one week. Uh, but obviously, when they when they come and when we come to that side, uh, we we build longer stays through longer longer uh, uh, projects and programs that we engage with. So this is very very uh, easy to to access. Uh, it's 
it's good. It, it provides a very good uh, framework to, to start discussing with your partners or potential partners in, uh, in Europe uh, and the other way around for Europeans present here to, to build uh, connections with, uh, with Southern Africa. Again, countries from um, the so-called Eastern Partnership of the EU, um, like, like Georgia, like Ukraine, like the countries that are represented here in this meeting, we can connect with you as well. We can, we can bring you into the circle so we can build a wider circle. And then we have three universities, uh, two like, for instance, Ishvan and I from, from two universities in the EU, plus two universities, one in, one, in, uh, uh, one in Ukraine and one in South Africa. So we can create networks. It's just a matter of, of time, ideas, energy to be put in these projects. And uh, there are opportunities. Uh, there are a lot of, of new fundings available at the moment. I mean, the, the sums are growing. Uh, there is a lot of interest, as you've heard earlier um, in, the, in the earlier speeches. There is a lot of interest in our countries on uh, Southern Africa. Uh, you are the Southern Africans are the new the newcomers on the market. It is important that we are present there. So strategically, politically, there is a goodwill and an openness. And uh, I, I think it's um, it's just a matter of paying the the price of doing the work, and then it will it will pay off. Uh, for sure, so there are opportunities. So I, I'll stop here. I know I know we are late with the with the with the meeting. Uh, I'm obviously open to for questions and and uh, yes, uh, willing to share more if need be if in private or on on various other uh, various other ways uh, afterwards. So thank you. Thank you again. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Silu, for uh, joining and also for uh, sharing those examples because you you are uh, that uh, strong link, uh, the person uh, uh, who been in the Stellenbosch University in South Africa and now you're in other part of the world um, in another continent, uh, but the, those links uh, continue and you're working to build them stronger. So I think we've got a lot to uh, learn from those uh, examples and also to see those opportunities more because maybe sometimes we are not uh, uh, open to uh, notice uh, those opportunities for collaboration. And I think this is one of those uh, events where we wanted to uh, open the diversity of uh, different um, uh, research that is open uh, is done by different uh, uh, sections and also to see what are the connections, what are the topics that uh, interest people. So if we can, um, uh, in the chat, um, uh, share the link to uh, menti.com and it's the same uh, process like we've done at the beginning. If you can uh, uh, follow the link, uh, put the code 18718971 and um, fill in uh, different uh, research topics that you think would be um, interesting. Can you see the screen? So we already um, see some of the topics that were I've put the uh, three people uh, filled in the form. And we can see that the cultural and the intellectual uh, connections um, are a little bit um, uh, stronger. Um, uh, if you uh, um, see the topic that is close to you, if you word it the same, then it's going to uh, be um, larger. So we can see the uh, cold war links, and uh, uh, we've heard that uh, in uh, uh, Monica's uh, presentation today, uh, I mentioned some ANC connections, and um, um, uh, we were looking at uh, foreign policies, um, so South African migration to uh, Poland, uh, Central Eastern European uh, integrated projects, diaspora policies, um, foreign policies are getting uh, stronger here. Um, Polish migration to uh, South Africa. So we can see uh, both uh, South African migration to Poland and Polish migration to South Africa. And I can imagine the topic has uh, both uh, uh, connections, uh, uh, historical dimension and um, uh, the current um, 
connections. Now our topic is getting uh, more and more uh, diverse, uh, but uh, some uh, stay stronger. So we can see the Cold War links, um, Polish migration to South Africa. I guess uh, we have a strong representation of uh, Polish community uh, here, foreign policies, Hungarian diaspora, cultural diplomacy, ethics and politics, um, tourism, uh, stereotypes, very interesting um, uh, topics we are um, getting all noticed here. Um, writers, cultural diplomacy, cultural diplomacy is mentioned a few times, My, migrants community, Ukrainian migrants, academic exchange, trade contacts. Um, so far, we've got 18 people who've um, uh, entered their uh, choices. Um, civ civic uh, activism is also one of the uh, topics uh, that is um, um, uh, mentioned. I think we've, uh, uh, we have um, a good uh, start uh, for our uh, discussion about uh, um, potential collaborations um, and um, the presentations that um, we've uh, heard just now. And uh, I will follow, I will uh, pass uh, the floor to uh, Kobus Rodemeyer to facilitate the uh, conversation. I'll keep the screen. If uh, anybody has uh, other ideas, uh, you can still put them in or um, for at least for the beginning of um, our uh, discussion, if that's all right, Liz Kobus. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tsuvinka. I am, um, uh, we, we had a discussion on the side here now about um, uh, questions and so on. I have so many questions, I actually don't know where to start. And all of them are good questions and um, two of them, or, or positive questions, not negative questions. Uh, two of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, and I suppose we have to uh, leave one of them right up to the end, but it's uh, listening to all the fascinating um, presentations this afternoon. And, and uh, thank you once again for everybody. I mean, that's, I wrote about five or six pages and um, yeah, I live in a part of South Africa where it's supposed to be not that cold, but it's bitterly cold. So thanks for keeping me writing. It helped me to keep warm. Uh, but I keep on thinking to myself the whole time, what, what have we left out? It's, it's almost like there's, um, I wouldn't say something missing, but, but uh, uh, and that, that's why I say I've, I've got so many questions, but I don't know where to actually start asking them because um, as I was writing them, I was, I was trying to number them one to 10. And then I started deciding, no, number three must be number one. So it's, uh, for me, it's a challenge in, in the sense of um, uh, knowing what to ask first. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, from the floor, there are any questions that we can take first because because I have two burning questions, but I will, I will leave them for a bit later on. So um, first of all, uh, is, is there any questions that you want to pose to any of the presenters from the floor? Um, Tavinga, I don't know what the best is going to be if we post that in the chat or uh, people can ask you directly. I think we can have a post. Uh, so you can post uh, questions uh, to the chat and we'll pick up them up from there. Or uh, you can also uh, raise your hand uh, if you would like to uh, have a wider comment, uh, maybe on uh, if uh, anyone um, wants to give the impression uh, or about all the presentations uh, that we've heard about similarities that you've picked up or um, specific uh, points. Uh, may I have one comment? Hello? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah, please, please go ahead, Ambassador. Yes. Mr. Ademeyer, uh, thank you very much, and Rinka, for this wonderful uh, uh, event. Uh, it was very informative, and I want to thank each of you, I mean, presenters. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, you just mentioned similarities, and uh, 
You know, I think beginning of 90s is defining moment for all of us Eastern Europeans because uh, I identified many, many similarity from that moment when, the, when this immigra immigration started and some uh, outflow of uh, people or inflow. So many, many similarities and uh, it's uh, it's very very fascinating actually, and uh, um, uh, uh, when we began today this uh, event, uh, we had one Georgian think tank also joining. He had to quit earlier, but he told me that uh, next year perhaps we wish we, we would also like to be part of this kind of as a presentation. Um, you know, uh, we are not uh, sometimes you know like with Eastern Europeans. Uh, there is certain presence, definitely, historically and now, as you said, and uh, uh, it may not be very big numbers of tens of thousands, but uh, uh, we Eastern Europeans sometimes can show that it is not about only uh, quantity, but about quality. So I think it's very important. And um, thank you again very much to uh, many of you whom I know personally. Uh, I mean, uh, it's been uh, really, really uh, fascinating. Uh, uh, and um, uh, Mr. Rogopete, also, I want to greet you. Uh, and the one thing, though, uh, you just mentioned that what we missed. Uh, um, I think um, uh, I may have missed it myself, uh, but um, the, um, I think um, uh, it would be good um, next uh, time or um, to reflect more. Um, uh, uh, about uh, exactly interconnections uh, between uh, like uh, Ukrainian communities, uh, Hungarian communities, uh, about those interconnections or some solidarity that we have or should have better solidarity even in this um, African continent, like we are having back home, you know, in uh, our uh, part of the world. And I think this is also for us diplomats, it is very important. We, all of us, Eastern Europeans, so we co cooperate very well, you know, as embassies. So I think we also should think for ourselves how to um, uh, kind of uh, work with you, our communities, and to have more uh, kind of joint interactions joint events. So this is one of the important things I feel we should uh, think together, all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, and it was wonderful, really. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And I, I fully agree with you being uh, given the, I, I think many of the presenters also mentioned that the whole idea of the 1990s being a, a collective point of start of many things. And um, I, I see also Chavinka has, has said in, in the comment that uh, this is the first event uh, going forward. Now, um, before this event, uh, the three of us, uh, Chavinka, Stefan and myself, spoke a lot about uh, the importance of this event um, going forward. And we spoke about the idea of, of, of a definite explosion that's going to take place. And I've, I've already seen many areas of of cooperation where people can start working together, not, not only the academics, but also diplomatically, as you rightfully said, Mr. Bassett. And I, I think it's, it's most definitely uh, looking at becoming a, an annual event. And um, the one thing I've, I've been making notes um, going forward, and, and I, I would like to get your input on that as well, um, the, the, the timing, uh, of, of the event during the day, because uh, I see it reached a peak at, at four o'clock, we were 47 and then it started dropping off. So uh, maybe that's that's something we'll keep in, in mind in future, but uh, definitely this is the first event of of many that that, that will happen going forward. Uh, if, uh, sorry. Maybe if if I can just uh, men mention uh, that uh, what on the point that the ambassador has uh, raised, and that uh, from uh, my experience, um, there were a few uh, examples where communities uh, from different uh, cultures would get um, together. Uh, one was um, uh, around the uh, church, about the Greek Orthodox Church that was uh, mentioned here. There was um, event. Uh, there were a few events on celebrating. Uh, uh, Cyrillic and um, uh, other um, religion uh, link um, uh, festivities uh, with uh, different communities. Um, I think uh, 
Also, another opportunity to collaborate is around management of uh, those diaspora organizations. And there are a lot of uh, similar uh, challenges that uh, our organizations are facing, and it would be uh, really nice to learn from each other and uh, from the projects uh, how they organized, uh, how the uh, community is uh, managed, and uh, what are the areas uh, that uh, work well. So this kind of uh, horizontal learning that, uh, for example, our community, we uh, um, collaborate with other Ukrainian uh, association as uh, uh, our association is member of uh, Ukrainian World Congress. Uh, so we um, collaborate with Ukrainian associations in other countries, but at the same time, uh, we would be very interested to collaborate with um, um, uh, communities, other uh, Eastern European, Central Eastern Europe, communities in the, uh, South Africa. And um, also to mention that uh, we hope that all those uh, presentation will be put uh, in the form of essays in one uh, publication, and this will be something that will also uh, help us uh, to uh, attract attention of uh, different uh, researchers in South Africa and in Central Eastern European communities who can read um, those who maybe were not able to participate today, but are interested in the topic. As you've heard, there are 400 uh, African students uh, only in uh, uh, Hungary, which is uh, fascinating. So I'm sure uh, all those uh, students are also our audience. Uh, so it's a matter of um, uh, connecting to those who are interested in that um, collaboration. Thanks. I can see Nikolai has also raised his uh, hand. Yes, thank you. I, I would like really to join um, with congratulations to all the uh, presentations that we had the chance to, uh, to hear and uh, we, we could all see how many um, not only similarities but joint topics appear and joint possibilities for future collaboration. Um, this is one point we raised at uh, our first uh, online meeting that we had with uh, uh, Dvinka and uh, Kobus and uh, Stefan when we discussed about this uh, really uh, rich potential of having uh, not just separate countries uh, as in the patchwork of uh, immigrant uh, uh, presence uh, in uh, South Africa, but also Eastern Europe as uh, just a wider, a larger um, uh, um, um, actor, agent, uh, and um, um, network of uh, uh, participants in such initiatives. So I, I, I'm really very happy uh, with uh, with this um, uh, uh, with this first meeting. I think uh, it uh, with this first conference, and it gives a really very good uh, start and promise for for future uh, such meetings and uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, on the as an anthropologist, uh, also as an a historian as a historian but uh, as an anthropologist so who have done field work in uh, south africa with a particular uh, focus I, I could see on the um on the, on the spot uh, so many uh, testimonies shared by the respondents about interactions with other immigrant communities as i said from southeastern europe eastern europe uh, central europe uh, i think you mentioned uh, religious holidays uh, festive celebrations uh, also along uh, Slavic uh, uh, countries or also along Cyrillic alphabet or just uh, mere occasions of uh, um, uh, adding um, shoulders of support and uh, uh, attention to other immigrant communities that uh, uh, some of the um, uh, inhabitants in this country know about and would like to show uh, interest and attention. So on the, on the spot, I'm sure, although I have had just two weeks visit and my observations are limited, but I could uh, really see that uh, such in uh, um, uh, in the um, in the in, in the field there is uh, a relatively high uh, level of collaboration and uh, interest of mutual just uh, working together and uh, joining together um, uh, among immigrants from Eastern Europe. So. Uh, why not having this uh, just furthermore voiced in a, a um, conference, academic and uh, also diplomatic and uh, 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 such networks of, uh, uh, that can further stimulate that. 
So I'm very, very um, enthusiastic about this possibility. And once again, just uh, congratulations to the organizers for making the first steps for for this uh, um, for this work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai. And it, it, yes, I fully agree with you. There's, there's so many things to, to, to cooperate with on. And um, I think it's going to take a while for, for us to keep, uh, well, for all of us that was involved today, to, to keep us congratulating one another. Um, I think it really went very well. Uh, I see there's two more hands. Uh, Istvan, maybe I think yours was up first. Thank you very much, Kobus. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, congrats to all of you, obviously, because this is really a stimulating event. And yes, a first step, as, as it was mentioned in the chat as well. And I think it's a great idea to, uh, drink, to, to think about a kind of a, a nice publication, potentially, of, of you know, today's uh, papers, presentations. Um, but I would like to join, actually, my good uh, colleague, uh, Silvio, um, concerning the potentials in you know, putting together joint projects. And we should look into a bit more of the European Union South African framework, because there are so many, so many, uh, you know, uh, opportunities out there. Uh, one was mentioned, actually, in fact, one of my students from PAGE is actually at the moment in Stellenbosch taking part, Christoph Neut, at this very moment in this particular event, using the international credit mobility scheme of the Erasmus Plus. But there are so many other triangular, whatever, multi multilateral kind of uh, options out there. So we should look as, as a network, if, if, you, if you wish, you know, look into these uh, very tangible options and, and you know, put together projects, apply for grants so that we can roll it on. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, thank Istvan, and uh, yeah, maybe uh, all those who are interested to stay in touch uh, can. Um, uh, we will be uh, sending follow-up information, but you can also mention in your in the chat uh, that you are interested uh, to collaborate. Uh, I'm going to include all speakers automatically, so you don't have choice. But uh, those from the uh, uh, participants uh, who are watching us uh, online, uh, and uh, also those who are here in the uh, Zoom. Uh, please uh, just uh, mention in the comments or write to info or other uh, calls a day uh, your information, the same link that you uh, registered or that was, and uh, we will put you in touch with this network. Thank you very much, uh, Tsovinka. I see there's, there's one hand up, uh, the ambassador of Ukraine, ambassador, please, please go ahead. Good evening. Uh, I know that uh, it's already that we are uh, running out of the time, so I will not take a lot of your time. It would be not fair not to congratulate all of you with this uh, nice discussion. And uh, first of all, uh, my congratulations to Ukrainian Association of South Africa and to all the parties of the research. This is a great um, initiative uh, and actually the presentation of the research, uh, the social economic connections between Eastern Europe and South Africa. Um, it's the first step and uh, it's the first time in the history that uh, this research uh, has been done. Uh, I really hope that uh, in uh, terms of uh, uh, scholars, it will be very interesting also for South African um, uh, uh, scholars to see uh, opportunities, uh, new opportunities, and to be interested in studying uh, connections and relations with the, the uh, Europe, especially with the uh, Eastern Europe. And from my side, I see the lack of such a research in general. Uh, so I'm proud that this initiative came from OASA and being implemented. Uh, I believe uh, this is, uh, the, the first one, not the last one, and I will support that from my side as well. Uh, I wish to mention that our experience shows the importance of collaboration between uh, the diaspora or the community with the embassy. And uh, it's showing itself very productive. So we can work together to enlarge into the region, regional scope, to the regional level, 
that um, the re representatives of uh, embassy of the region and uh, the representatives of their communities are organizing joint events, uh, support each other's initiatives. Uh, so that uh, also brought me today to, to this idea. So thank you for everyone for this interesting discussion and for your presentations. Ambassador, thank you so much. And thank you also for your continued support on this. Uh, Savinka has, has kept us in the loop of, of your continued support. So thank you very much from our side for that as well. We really appreciate that. I, uh, I don't know if there are any questions still. I, I don't see uh, any in the chat. Uh, I don't know if, if there's anybody that, that wants to make more comments. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted and I was saying I want to, I want to uh, make a comment at the end or ask a question and uh, I think many people have already actually answered it, but it's, it's almost like a, a rhetorical question, uh, where to from now, because I've, it's, it's been so wonderful to, to have been involved for, for more than three hours um, discussing things with so many similarities and so many uh, things that that you realize maybe I can give an input on the, on this maybe I can join in in working on this and it's really uh, both ambassadors have also also mentioned that how how great it is to see um, different communities uh, from Eastern Europe getting together in South Africa and talking about this and and having different academic colleagues from from Eastern Europe uh, also on this platform. And um, I, I do agree with you, um, Istvan, I think you've made the co comment and other, other colleagues have also made the comment. I think it's, it's important that we have more um, South African academics involved as well. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, some of my colleagues, history colleagues from Soplike University was here and also Ian McQueen from University of Pretoria is here. So it, it would be great to get more people from, from this side involved as well. Uh, Javinka, I see you have you've, you've posted back uh, the the Mentimeter screen. I don't know if you want to make a comment on that. Uh, so th this could be inspiration for uh, questions, and also that we once again uh, see those uh, links. Um, I think uh, there were so many uh, topics that we discussed uh, that would be interesting to see in comparison. Uh, uh, obviously, like the development of um, uh, institutions, uh, the numbers of migration, and uh, also the connection to different political events in South Africa and also in the uh, countries, uh, CE countries, uh, and uh, how that affects uh, migration. I think uh, one of the uh, as uh, uh, what the, most of uh, presentations uh, that uh, uh, were on the migration specifically would use estimated number of migrants. Uh, so clearly, there is a lack uh, of um, clarity around the numbers of. Um, um, uh, Europeans in the South Africa, and I think it's the same for numbers of uh, African uh, in the Africans in the uh, Eastern European, Central Eastern European countries. As uh, Istvan mentioned, those uh, communities are also uh, largely uh, overlooked. So there are uh, also opportunities. There is an opportunity to look. Uh, into uh, that. I think uh, with regards to uh, one of the steps uh, forward, as I mentioned, we will uh, probably uh, continue uh, discussion uh, with uh, a network. I hope that this conference uh, can um, happen against, uh, again uh, next year, but also that maybe we can um, look more into those uh, comparison about what how our communities are uh, managing different situations and, and how they are um, uh, um, collaborating um, between each other and also about uh, the research that has been done on those communities. As um, um, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador uh, mentioned, uh, this is the first research on the South African community and uh, it's uh, almost the first research on African uh, continent into Ukrainian community. I don't know how uh, much research has been done in uh, other communities, but um, there is uh, uh, probably a gap in, um, in the research 
so we can uh, share methodology and look into um, what specifically was um, um, researched by different um, yeah different academics. Uh, Chavinka, thank you very much. Yes, I fully agree with that. And uh, I was looking while while you had the, the, the screen up there, I was thinking of, of you know, the, the only problem we have with, with a conference like this is um, ideally it would take place once, once a year only. So I think one of the things we should start thinking of is, is looking at uh, different platforms that we can use going forward. Uh, to, to, to keep the discussions going. Uh, um, I'm, I'm actually quite intrigued to see that uh, the, the Cold War link is, is, is one of the ones that's, that's the biggest at this stage. So uh, definitely they would, they would be, um, we, we must start thinking of different platforms where we can continue this discussions uh, leading up to, to a next conference again. Um, going going forward sometime next year. Right, I, I just want to make sure um, if, if there are any other questions that you want to pose to the collective or maybe to one of one of the um, of the presenters. Because if if not, then I think we should start wrapping up. Uh, it is it has been a, a long afternoon, but a, a fascinating afternoon and it's it, it was really very pleasant to, to listen to all the presentations and to listen to all the discussions that, that took place. So I would uh, like to, on, on, on behalf of basically the Ukrainian Association of, of South Africa, and once again, the Ukrainian ambassador, also the Polish Association of South African Deportees in South Africa, and the, uh, the support of, of the Polish embassy, and also on behalf of Sol Plaque University, I would really want to thank you all for, for attending. Thank you so much to all the presenters uh, and, and thanks for, for you as the audience for sticking with us for the last three and a half hours. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to new discussions that's gonna come forth from this and I'm exciting to see what happens in the future. So thank you very much for attending. Thanks for everybody for presenting. And it was an awesome afternoon. Thank you very, very much. Keep well, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.